اللوجو بتاعك جميل. عملناه فوق اهو هتلاقيه موجود فوق جميل جدا ان شاء الله الشباب يظبطوا الدنيا باذن الله ان شاء الله ان شاء الله احنا المفروض طلعنا دلوقتي على البرودكاست بس بناخد حوالي وقت لحد ما الناس تتجمع فربنا يسهل ان شاء الله وكل تاخير وفيها خير دكتور محمود منور يا باشا اهلا وسهلا حبيبي نورك يا احمد ازيك احنا وي ويل وي ويل وي ويل سبيك ان انجلش تو از ذير از ماني ماني دينتست هو ار فولوينج اس بس احنا مستنيين الناس كلها تتجمع ونشرح لهم الدنيا وبعد كده نخش بقى على اللايف ومعاك المايك براحتك كل النولج اللي عندك احنا محتاجين نسمعه النهارده. شور اوكي ثانك يو فيري ماتش. السلام عليكم يا شباب انا بس محتاج الناس اللي دخلت في اللايف تقول لي لو كان الصوت واضح ولا لا. احمد انا محتاجك تبعت لي اللينك عشان اعمل شير. حالا حالا هبعته لك احنا اللايف على فكره خلينا في نفس الوقت. اللايف في نفس الدقيقه هبعته لك على ال... على الواتساب على طول تمام؟ اوكي. احنا بس مستنيين بس حد يرد علينا يقول لنا صوتك واضح ولا لا؟ انا بالنسبه لي صوتك بيقطع. اوكي انا سامعك انا سامعك كويس، الصوت واضح، الدكاتره بتقولوا الصوت واضح. تمام. طيب السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته. النهارده الحلقه ال 15 مع دكتور يعني يعني انا بعتبره اول واحد دخل الديجيتال سمايل ديزاين في مصر. تمام اسمحوا لي بس في الاول اقدم لكم دكتور محمود عزت استاذنا ومعلمنا في مجال الديجيتال سمايل ديزاين وراجل جراح وبروستونتكس وبيريدونتكس وكل حاجه فيها دينتكس في الاخر دكتور محمود ملم بيها راجل يعني على انا على مستوى شخص بتعلم من الحالات بتاعته كتير قوي لما بيكون في حاله فيها ديجيتال سمايل ديزاين بلجا له انا بس عندي حاجة هقولها إن إحنا المحاضرة هنحتاج إن إحنا نقولها بالإنجليزي لأن عندنا فولورز كتار جدا بيتكلموا إنجليزي ومش عارفين عربي فاسمحوا لنا إن إحنا النهاردة هنتكلم بالإنجليزي وده مش مش ديسكريمينيشن ولا حاجة ولكن عشان في ناس متابعانا بس مستنيين بس حد يرد علينا يقول لنا صوتك واضح ولا لأ بس أنت وصلت للينك كده خلاص أه طيب على بركة الله هشير برضه اسمحوا لنا ان احنا النهارده دكتور محمود وده مش مش مستنيين بس حد يرد علينا صوت واضح ولا لا بس انت وصلت لللينك ده خلاص اه طيب انا بركه الله ممكن بس تضبط الصوت عندك يا محمود وده مش تمام خلاص اوكي مستنيين بس حد يرد علينا طيب ايوه تمام So uh, today we will start a new lecture. طيب أنا معك يا أحمد. Sorry, معلش. Today we will start a new lecture with Dr. Mahmoud Azzat, a pioneer in digital smile design. Dr. Mahmoud, would you please introduce yourself to the community? So hello everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you, Ahmed, for the great efforts you've been doing uh, with uh, all these uh, free online lectures from the beginning of. Uh, of us staying at home. I think you've been working for the past two weeks very hard and you still have two more weeks of schedules ahead. Uh, you have been doing a great job, actually. Uh, I'm very proud of what you've, uh, of what you've accomplished. And I'm sure that a lot of people are benefiting from what you're doing. You're one of the top uh, educational platforms that are now uh, live uh, nearly the whole day. Uh, and I see huge numbers uh, attending every single online lecture that you're giving. Uh, so thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you for your contribution to everyone. Thank you. Uh, thanks. The thanks should go to you and your colleagues who are uh, volunteering their time and their knowledge for such a great community. Thank so you. Thank you, thank Dr. Mahal. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Digital Dentistry Society for also uh, giving us the opportunity to go live on their page so uh, uh, all our international participants can also and members of uh, Digital Dentistry Society can uh, participate with us in, in this course today. Uh, my name is Mahmoud Ezzet. I am uh, a board member of Digital Dentistry Society. I'll give you uh, a, um, a few details about DDS at the end of the lectures. So whoever's interested in, in, jo in joining this group um, of international uh, dentists that have formed a society, a worldwide society, 
to spread uh, digital knowledge worldwide. As you know, that um, whenever you have something new uh, in the era of dentistry, uh, you need uh, an entity or society to control uh, the educational part and to make sure that the education that's given uh, to all the people is validated and uh, is up to date. So this is mostly uh, what DDS is doing. Uh, I'm also the president of DDS Arab Union. Uh, we are a group of the Arab countries uh, joined together on the umbrella of Arab Union, uh, under the umbrella, of course, of Digital Dentistry Society. And I'm also a certified uh, DSD instructor. Thank you, Dr. Mahmoud, for this nice introduction and this uh, rich in introduction. I would, I would, uh, I would share with you something. Uh, actually, when we, uh, I can remember our first time when we met. It was with Dr. Uh, when when you were part of the team of uh, digital smile design in, in Egypt, uh, and Dr. Kristen Coachman and uh, Dr. Liviu. Uh, they were participating. I can remember exactly the effort you did and the, the, the I would say, the, the contribution to our dental side. I would ask you a special question. Yes, please go ahead. What is the most important thing from your, your point of view you did while you were young it makes a difference with you or this dish? Uh, as you said, uh, of course, there were, there were always uh, a lot of things that changed uh, the way I was thinking, that changed my career in a way. Uh, but one of uh, the main uh, things that happened with me uh, was when I was introduced to digital smile design. This was the beginning for me in digital dentistry. Uh, I was at the stage of, uh, I was then teaching at uh, a private university in Cairo. Uh, I was teaching the membership and restorative dentistry speciality program. Uh, and uh, at that point with my cases, I had started doing a lot, lot of aesthetic cases. Yes, and I, I, I can see, I, I'm actually, I'm a big fan of your work. You, 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 you started from the clinical to the to the lab work to the to the whole of the the, the, the production line. So please tell tell me exactly how how could you manage all of this? Yeah, so um, it started uh, with me in the position of uh, doing a lot of aesthetic cases for my patient. Mostly at that time they were veneers because that was the the at that time and still at this time this is what mostly what all patients or most patients are always looking for aesthetics uh so uh, and my mentor at that time with aesthetic dentistry uh is was doctor uh, and still till now uh dr Tariq salah he's one of the first people that had really taught me uh how to do aesthetic diagnosis and uh, how to work with uh, veneer cases and i even started uh doing that uh, with him uh, together uh asking always about the cases and how to treatment plan together anyway so i was at the position that uh everything would go perfect with the patient until the day of uh cementation the day of cementation was the nightmare uh was my uh, stomach uh, starting to feel upset was me starting to be afraid of uh how my patient would uh, react to how these would look in her mouth the veneers would look perfect on the model, perfect fit, perfect margins, uh, the shade, the texture, everything would be fantastic. And I would always get, uh, when I would get my ceramics from the lab, I would check everything. If I had any problems, I would go back to the lab, readjust, so that when the patient comes in, everything is perfect. But then we would start fitting this into the patient's mouth, trying them in the patient's mouth, and this is where the nightmare starts. We start uh -huh. to look. We start and? to feel that there's a fact, there's something wrong, but we okay. don't know and we cannot detect where the problem is. And then we start showing the patient the mirror and then the nightmare starts. The nightmare of the patient starting to, of course, not giving a wow reaction that you had been expecting because you had put so much effort into the plan and so much effort in the, the preps and you would do try to do perfect preparations and perfect impressions as much as possible, of course, and retract as much as uh, possible and do every single step perfectly. 
and then you would expect the patient to go like wow or thank you even or you you would not get that reaction at all from the patient the reaction you would get from the patient was oh they look funny oh i don't like this oh can we adjust this can we adjust that and i remember can, a case. can we change our yes <laughs> <laughs> yes exactly i remember a case that came in at 9 p.m and the next huh? day her her flight was at uh, 10 a.m and i stayed me and my assistants we stayed in the clinic till eight my clinic's just uh 15 minutes away from the airport we kept adjusting from 9 p.m till 8 a.m just before her flight ah. and she still Ouch. left ah. she is... still left not happy at all and this is when it's it's like this was like a, a huge trigger for me there is something wrong here i would go back to my mentors and i would ask them where where it went wrong and i would we would we already had planned the case together uh but what i found out later on of course was the main problem was that we were looking at a model that had nothing to do with the patient yes this is the patient's teeth but where's the relation of the model to the patient's face because the teeth at the end could look so nice and beautiful and amazing on a model but when you put it in the patient's mouth it doesn't it doesn't look good on that face so when you think of it think of it as a as a as a very nice uh, let's say painting okay the painting okay. will never be perfect unless it looks good around with the background okay with the background of that painting so it's the same with our patient's teeth the, the ceramics or whatever cosmetic work you do for your patient's mouth will never look perfect or you will never know how they would look on the patient unless you see them on the face because the face the lips the cheeks and the face are the background of those teeth so this is when i started to understand that i had a problem i didn't know at that time that the problem was that i didn't have the face there i didn't plan according to my patient's face in the beginning although we had learned this in our universities that you had to do macro assessment first or macro analysis with the face and then micro analysis but okay. never no one really showed us how to join both together so then i started to uh, to search and i came upon uh, the dsd world tours that christian coachman and libio shinaga were doing at that time the whole dsd team and i started looking at their videos uh, of the of the ads they were doing for the courses i liked the idea very much i got even more interested and uh, as soon as i saw the ad i went i registered for a course straight away at that time it was uh, in uh, in abu dhabi okay uh -huh. and this I was remember in this course very clear. It, yeah. was, it was with as alum right yes exactly ah, and we I were remember. it was an amazing course we were one about 130 participants uh -huh. at least 45 to 50 uh, of us were egyptian dentists we were there because we wanted to understand more uh, but I did a. I have something. There's something that I usually do before I go for any course. I try to teach myself first, and I okay. start to uh, try to learn the concept as much as possible. Of course, you would never be able to learn the concept totally unless uh, the people that really understand and giving you all the input. But I tried as much as possible to understand as much as possible uh, what I'm going to take. So that when I'm there at the course. Um, I can really, uh, let's say, get the points that I really need to understand. You know what I mean? When you go to a course and you don't really understand the concept, then you, and in the midst, you're, 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 you don't know where you are, right? But when you really study hard before you go, it's totally different. So I, one month before the course, I, would, I was then teaching at the university, of course. I used to spend my day from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the university, then go to the clinic. I would finish at 10, 11 p.m. I would stay up from 11 p.m. to about 4 to 5 a.m. Uh, going through all these YouTube videos of how to do the smile design on Keynote and PowerPoint. And I would uh, take photographs of my patients and I would try to do the, the, the Keynote or the smile design uh, that we used to do at, at that time on PowerPoint. I was uh, determined to go to the course having at least one or two cases at least done because there was an there and there still is there is an accreditation process to digital smile design that when you attend the official course you become a member and then you have to finish three cases and then you become a master and then after that you can become a certified lab and instructor so i wanted to reach 
the instructor level. So I was determined to always, I always try to finish everything real quick. So I actually finished two cases. I did their smile designs on PowerPoint and I reached to the level of doing their ceramics. The results weren't that perfect, but they were much better from what I was able to learn from a few bits and pieces of YouTube, of videos on YouTube. And then I went to the course. Uh, this is when pure luck and faith came in. Uh, uh, and of God, uh, of course, uh, uh, whatever happens is, is, is God's will at the end and, uh, 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 and, and how it works out. Uh, the day or the night before the course, I was on the I was sitting in the cafe that was uh, downstairs in the hotel, and uh, Christian and uh, Livio were 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 sitting in the cafe also, and they were passing by me, and they saw me on my laptop uh, on PowerPoint trying to do the smile design, and then Livio stopped and he looked and he's like, uh, "What are you doing?" I was like, uh, "I'm doing a smile design." He's like, "Are you attending a course here?" He's like, "Yes, I'm attending your course." And he's like, uh, and he told me, so why are you trying to do the smile design before the course? I don't know, I'm, I'm trying actually to uh, get uh, to understand as much as possible before I start the course. So he liked the idea very much. So they were sitting, they left me. Uh, they said, okay, we're going to leave you work. And then they sat on a separate table. And then when they saw that I had closed my laptop after about uh, 45 minutes, they called me in and they asked me to, to sit with them. And this is when we started to get to know each other even more. And, uh, I told Christian at that time, Christian, I, I have two cases finished already. And Christian was like, yeah, yeah, Mahmoud, okay, no problem. I'll have a look at them, but let's attend the course first. And, and if you feel that you still want to show me the cases, then show me them. I was like, okay. So after the first day I attended, I was totally amazed. Uh, of course, I started to understand the bits and pieces that I didn't understand in the beginning. I started to adjust those overnight when I was uh, at the hotel. And the next day I saw, I showed Christy my cases. He liked them very much. He put me into contact with John, his brother. And uh, within, after the course, within a month or two, I became a DSD master because they had accepted the first two cases that I did and I only had one case left. So this is the beginning of digital dentistry to me. I didn't know at that time that this was actually, there was something called digital dentistry. The only thing I wanted to do was give my patients the amazing looking veneers that we or the restorations that we all see on social media and uh, and on facebook and we all wish to be able to post uh, photos that look the same and give our patients really what they deserve and what they have uh, what they have paid us and what they have asked us uh, to do and uh, it just went in, went on from there and uh, it was a very successful partnership uh, yes. As you told me before the live broadcasting, you prepared something special, a special lecture, uh, specially yes. designed for the Corona time. So, can we uh, can we start uh, sharing the lectures here? One yes. minute. You can you can find it here. Yeah, you and want me to? Uh, yeah. Yes. You, we we shall start the lecture. Yes. You can. We can, and I would ask you gently to. Uh, to accept the the post and the page because we have many requests from people uh, in uh, the DSD team members Egypt study group uh, they they cannot see the live because uh, an admin have to accept the, the chair okay on the on the page on the group so I don't know if I close this will I uh, let me try to open it from here just a second sorry about that okay sorry. take your time it's on uh, I send you the link on the WhatsApp so you can find it yeah. Oh, I can see now all your inbox. Yeah, out of oh, secrets. Okay. <laughs> no, no cases. No it's okay, cases. It's, it's okay. No problems. <laughs> no cases nowadays. It's there's, okay. there's nothing to hide. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get to the notifications. Just a sec. I think I can go to the group straight away. Yes, exactly. Yeah. I went to the yeah, okay. Oh. 
the internet is uh, yeah there Because we received many requests from the group, they cannot see the live, so uh, yeah. we asked you to, to put the approval. I'm just afraid you that if I go... Uh, from the mobile, you can do it from the mobile directly. Yeah, but because I don't know if I close this page here, uh, there's an X at the live that I'm on, that I'm no, showing no, on no my worry. timeline. I, no okay. worry, no worry. Yes, it's okay. No, it says end lot watch party. Uh, okay, no worry, no worry, you can do it, no worry. Okay. Let me try to... Yep, there, okay. Is it done? Yeah, just a sec. Okay. Let me go to the group. There. Approve all, done. Okay, right. Yes, here we are. So now Perfect. to the lecture directly. Surprise yes. us, Mr. Mahmoud. Uh, hope so. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now the so, mic with you. You can go ahead. Yeah. So uh, the main point of the lecture today is, uh, to me, digital dentistry actually is has made me a better treatment planner, and this I found out by time. Uh, um, this was not my plan. Uh, actually, I went into digital dentistry because, as I said, I started with digital smile design, and then. As Ahmed also suggested from there, uh, we had to originate a, a certified DSD lab in Egypt to support all the courses that were, uh, or the participants that I was giving courses because the, the lab has to understand the process also to be able to deliver for the dentists. So I went into uh, uh, the, the lab part or the technical part uh, with my wife, Dr. Iman Mossad. She is the CEO of, uh, of Digital Smile Lab, the certified lab we have in Egypt right now. And then uh, we went into milling machines, into CAD CAM dentistry, and then into 3D printers. And then I bought my first intraoral scanner. This was how I went into digital dentistry. But with all those that equipment and everything else, uh, what digital dentistry really has given me, it has made me a better treatment planner. So this is mostly what I'll be talking about, okay? So uh, a quick overview about uh, digital dentistry first. Uh, they're made of three main parts. Uh, capturing, processing, and designing, and manufacturing. Okay, so this is real quick so that we can get into the topic and we don't take too much time, uh, too much of your time. So capturing first, we capture with cameras, we can capture with intraoral scanners or bench scanners or lab scanners, and we can capture the bone with the CBCTs, okay? And when we bring in all that information and capturing is our diagnostic part, is where we take our diagnostic records, but with digital equipment, okay? And then we bring in all these files into our laptops or into our computers onto softwares. And this is where we process uh, uh, these images uh, or the diagnostic records that we have. And we start to design accordingly. And according to our design or the designs or the templates or the guides that we have designed, we then start to manufacture by milling or printing or sintering. It's that easy, okay? So we'll talk about capturing first. So capturing with cameras, and this is, uh, where smile design or the 2D uh, smile design came in, capturing photos of the patient's face uh, and taking videos with your phones or with professional cameras. Of course, we recommend to take the photos with DSLR cameras because you usually have a one-to-one -one image without any distortion and you can take videos with your uh, smartphones. So this is the beginning. So what do you, what's the information that you get from there? From the photos, you, you get an overview of the patient's face. You have diagnostics of the patient's face. And with the video, you have that in motion because the photo is a still photo of the patient smiling. And then you have to really see the, the patient's true dynamics. Because if you ask me to smile, I will never give you a natural smile. But when you uh, take a video of me and you say something uh, really funny in the, in, in the midst of the video, I will smile real hard and it will be a natural smile. So, we use the photo to do the smile design on. And as I said before, and we'll understand even more that the, how important the face is, uh, how important it is to have the face there to be able to design uh, how our teeth are going to look on the patient, okay? Because the face is our background. And we use the video as a reference to see the full extent of our patient's smile. And this we usually see with gummy smile cases where they already are conscious about their problems and they know very well how to hide uh, their defects in their smiles. Every 
every any 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 girl you see or any lady you see sitting at a cafe or if you just ask her to take a selfie she has a certain pose she has a certain uh, view they know very well which side looks best with how their smile looks best so they know how to very well because they're conscious about their problems how to hide it so the video gets them off guard and you'll be able you're able to see uh, the true extension of the smile the next part of capturing is uh, interoral scanners and something very important about digital dentistry is you do not need to be, uh, you, not, you do not need to have all the finances or all the money to become a digital dentist, actually. You do not need to buy an interoral scanner if you don't have the money. Of course, if you can, this would be uh, perfect and make your life easier. And there's tons of advantages of interoral scanners there. But there's an, an, another way. You can just take an impression, but take a good impression with the additional silicon of your uh upper and lower teeth and send this to your lab technician and your lab technician can scan uh, he will pour them into into uh, cast models of course and he can scan them and then he will have that as a digital format uh and send it to you so that you can put it on your laptop if you have softwares or others to use so you do not need to uh invest into oral scanners um uh, although if you the first thing and the first step that i always say to every, anyone who is really interested in digital dentistry is if you want to really go into digital dentistry the first step is bu is buying an intraoral scan this is going to do wonders for your clinics okay so again uh, an intraoral scanner is when you have the scanner in your hand and you scan your patient intraorally a bench scanner is when you take an impression send this to your lab and there's tons of labs now there's not a lab i think worldwide that does not have a bench scanner now they can scan your models for you and they can send you uh the files so that you can use them or you can send them to your digital lab so that they can design that for you okay and the third step is cbcts where they give information 3d information about the bone and teeth of course but of course the bone uh, in a more uh, definite way. So when we join all these three together, what have we, what do we have now? When we have a, when we take a photo of our patient's face while the patient is smiling, now we have an overview of the face. And then when we do an intraoral scan, we now have an overview of the teeth and soft tissue. And then when we also take a CBCT, we have an overview of the patient's bone and skull in 3D and all of this in 3D. And when we join all this information together this is when we have a digital format of our patient and this is the main advantage of digital dentistry that you are transforming your physical patient into a visual patient now imagine that a patient comes in to your clinic you start diagnosing real quick and this takes about five to ten minutes let's say it takes half an hour even an hour okay and then there's so many times and you take all these diagnostic information there's so many times where you bring the patient back or you had wished that you hadn't dismissed the patient before you had taken this certain record because there's you have missing information there, okay? And this is where the treatment planning part comes in. When you have this virtual patient, everything on top of each other, you can see it's as if your patient is there on your laptop in front of you. You can spend as much time as you want planning this case. And this is where true diagnostics come in. And our main problem, what I started to find out or when I started to see with my cases, my main problem was that I did not see this problem from the beginning or I did not see this issue from the, from the beginning. So the main issue is, or our main problem, is visualization, right? So when you have this on your laptop, imagine the amount of information you can get from there. So after you have captured, we then go to the part of processing and designing. And this is what I exactly mean, what I mean exactly. Now we have a CBCT here, we have the patient's face, and this is a face scan, which you can also take now with your mobile phones of, if you want, with an application called Bellos 3D that's become very common uh, worldwide now. And most people are using, but of course there are advantages and disadvantages to face scans and advantages of disadvantages of using 2D photos. You just need to know when to use this and when it's best to use the other, okay? And how to implement them with each other. Anyway, so you have a photo of the face, you have the CBCT, you have the patient's model, the model, which is an intraoral scan or a bench scan showing the soft tissue and teeth. And when you register all three on top of each other, this is when you have the virtual patient. And if you see the photo on uh, uh, the right, the virtual patient photo, you can see the patient in layers. You can see the teeth, you can see the gums, you can see the bone, you can see the face, and you can see them all in relation to each other. And this is what's even more important. 
Because let's say I want to the, uh, plan, a, uh, this patient has a gummy smile, like this patient we have here. Now I want to know where my CEJ is. I can see this on my CBCT. I, I want to know where the soft tissue is. I can see this on the intraoral scan. I want to know where the gingival margin is now. I can see this also on the intraoral scan. So what, what do I need to do? Do I need to do crown lengthening or not? Do I need to uh, do just a simple soft tissue gingivectomy or not? You can see all this information at once. How is this going to look on the patient's face? So every single uh, decision you make for a patient, it depends on a lot of things. The decision isn't just, oh, this patient has short teeth. Let's do a crown lengthening. Let's remove bone. So what about the crown root ratio? When I, do a, when I do a surgical crown lengthening or bone removal for this patient, what about the crown root ratio? What happens there? Is it going to stay one-to-one? -one? What about my ferule? Do I have enough ferule for that or not? What about the uh, new gingival margin? Will it decrease my patient's gummy smile uh, or not? What about the height-to-width ratio of the teeth? Can't I see this on my intraoral scan? So all the information is there and nothing is missed. And this is the true value of digital dentistry. Ahmed, are you with me? Can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Sir. Perfect. Okay. So from there, the next step is, like we said, is processing and designing. And this is where we start to register all the information on top of each other. And this is where we start our diagnostics. <coughs> Sorry. And the next step is the most important where we start treatment plan. Now, the best way to treatment plan your case is do a wax up. This is the most efficient way to do a treatment plan. Why? Because when, when you have the diagnostics, when you've put everything on top of each other and you've aligned all the information, this is your starting point, right? And yes. when you've done the wax up, this is your end point. So what's the shortest way from the starting point to the end point? The straight line. It's that easy. But mostly what happens with us in dentistry with full arch mouth, uh, full mouth rehab cases or even a simple veneer case, is in the middle, you know, don't know where you are anymore. It's just like when you're driving and Google Maps goes crazy and you don't know where you want to go. Imagine the amount of frustration that we're always in when you're on the street and someone's uh, about to call you and they tell you, you're on the way and they tell you, oh, just give me five minutes and I'll tell you which way to go. And you just keep going on the street when you don't know where to go. You don't know your endpoint. This is what happens with us in dead street. And this frustration is not only for dentists, it's for dentists and patients. Patients know that very well. Because all we do most of the time, because we didn't know better, we didn't see all this information from the beginning, we did not have the definitive treatment plan without any changes in the middle, is we keep giving our patients excuses. Why? Because we didn't see from the beginning. Oh, I, I, uh, that tooth needs a root canal. I'm sorry. This tooth is going to need a crown lengthening in the midst of the treatment. Oh, I'm sorry, we won't be able to uh, do the surgery that we, we told you about. We're going to have to change the plan just a little. This happens with every patient that comes into your clinic. Why? Because you didn't have true visualization in the beginning. Why? Because you did not have the definitive treatment plan. And there's no way to give the treatment plan unless you have the diagnostics. And you're able to diagnose this very carefully and efficiently using digital technologies. This is the true advantage of going digital and again you do not need to buy all this equipment to become a digital dentist you just need to use the labs and they will help you and they will scan for you and they will do cbcts for you if you want all you need to do is just take photos buy a dslr camera that's the only thing you need to do to start going digital okay not just to be a digital dentist but to be able to get that true visualization and to get the true treatment plan so from there as we said we start to design now what do we design depending on the case, we start with the wax up first and the wax up that we do because we have the face already from a photo that we have taken from the patient is a facially guided wax up and we'll understand more the value of this. So the wax up is done according to the patient's face, what would look best on this patient, okay? It's a customized smile for that patient. That patient hasn't come to you asking for someone else's smile. They haven't come asking for, it's not just like, you know, it's not like, uh, Patients are not buying a set of teeth uh, from a store. They're going to a professional dentist that really understands mm -hmm. their limitations and knows what they need and knows what will look best on them. So it has to be custom for that patient. But when you only send the model to your lab technician and ask him to design a wax up or to design veneers for you, what's he doing? He's just doing it according to the model. But what's the information that the model is giving him? And we're going to get into that point later on. So from there, we started to design guides, something to help us 
to start to do want in the patient's mouth. Meaning, let's say I have an implant case. Okay, I took a CBCT, I have an intraoral scan, I have the face there if I need it, and I start to plan virtually where the implant should be placed, the angulation, the position, the depth of the implant, where to look best according to the prosthetics, of course. And is there enough bone there or not? Okay, do we have enough soft tissue thickness there or not? Do we stop there? Do we stop virtually that we have design of where the implant should be and that's it? No. What we're able to do is after I have that perfect position of the implant virtually on the software, I can start to design a guide, a guide that I can put in my patient's mouth and, in, and will take that plan or translate the plan that I have on the software exactly to what my hand is going to do in my patient's mouth, giving precision, giving accuracy, and giving predictability. This is the most important part. So when we design, we do not only design a virtual uh, design of what we want to do, we also design a guide to help us at the end execute this. And when we have these guides designed, the next step is when we start the manufacturing process. Now there are two main ways of manufacturing uh, anything in dentistry, a subtractive and an additive process. The additive process is 3D printing, and this is going to be the future of dentistry because we are now, there's a, tons of studies uh, of 3D printing uh, zirconia, okay? And milling, of course, that we all know is a subtractive process. So what's the problem with milling? Milling, of course, is uh, 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 the only way now that we can uh, manufacture ceramics, of course. But the problem with milling is subtractive. It's more expensive. You have a larger block that goes into, that is milled into a smaller part. But the biggest advantage of 3D printing is that it's additive. But the disadvantage now is that we can only depend on certain resins with 3D printing. So we can manufacture models, abutments, frameworks, most important restorations. And with 3D printing, we can 3D print models, guides, and temporary restorations. But we cannot print till now or 3D print till now restorations. That is the biggest disadvantage. And imagine in the next coming years, this is going to happen. In three, four years max, we're going to see this 3D printing of restorations. And then when you 3D print ceramics, what's going to happen is you can layer them and imagine the beauty of the ceramics then because one advantage of milled ceramics is that it's one block and it's not it's never going to be as beautiful as the lab technician layering your ceramics but when do you need you need that when you have a central to a center when you're replacing only one tooth this is when you need a true a master lab technician to start to build up that ceramic for you but when you have multiple teeth being done you do not need this. And we'll understand also the advantages of doing it milled because it's controlled by the digital process. It's more precise because we're going to pre-design everything. We're going to show everything to the patient before we start. And then we're going to give the patient that same end result. I can never do this with my hands unless I have machines and softwares to get that done. Okay. okay. So this was the quick intro about digital dentistry. If we have questions or if you have any questions, Ahmed, I can answer well, them now. I, and we, then we, we, the we have a little question, but I think you are answering the question during the lecture. I mean, the, the question okay. is what are the kind of apps you are using? Someone is replying to him. And uh, the question is, uh, it's, it's most of them are basic questions. So I think you answered it with the, with the lecture. Perfect. I will okay. collect the whole uh, the whole questions. And uh, if there is something related to the topic, we will answer. Uh, I will ask you directly about it. Excellent. OK. Am I going too fast? Because I'm trying to cover you, mostly we, everything before I start. Before uh, the time, we we, we uh, our our time is up. I'm sorry. Okay. Am I going too fast, you, or is it okay? It's okay. Excuse me. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. Yes. So, the main objectives uh, of today, we're going to give uh, a. a in details what digital smile design is about, okay? And how we could implement this in digital dentistry and how, uh, and then we're going to go to a few cases and uh, I'm going to show you how we can do this on, on different types of cases, okay? So our objectives today is to show you how the digital smile design can do a paradigm shift in your practice. Uh, I'm going to show you very quickly uh, how we do this and the tools that we use to implement every single step. Now, if I want to summarize digital smile design in one slide. This is the slide. Uh, four main aspects of digital smile design and also of digital dentistry. It starts with the smile frame and the smile frame meaning that we use the patient's face as a guide to design the patient's teeth. And this is very important, a facially guided design 
so that we can give the patient that customized, beautiful, amazing smile that we see and we want and we wish to give our patients, okay? So it starts all with the smile frame. So what do we do? We take photos of our patients. We draw lines on the patient's face that guide us as clinicians and it guides our lab technicians to where to place the ceramics or where to place the new set of teeth, move them orthodontically, where to replace the tooth with implants because a lot of people think that BSD is mostly about veneers. No, it's about every single aspect of dentistry you can imagine and we'll see this at the end. So we start with the smile frame, okay? And then the next step is the motivational mock-up where we start to persuade our patients or motivate our patients to go for the treatment because it's it's uh, it's a lot of all, of, all of us are doing marketing right now or have a company that does marketing for us where we where they bring in patients for us. But are they responsible also to retain those patients for us? No. Are they responsible also to sell the, the sell the products or the services that we give in the clinic? No, they're only responsible to bring your patients to the to your door. Your job as a dentist is to sell your service. You are at the end selling a service to a client that comes into your clinic. So you have to be very good at sales. Because if you're not good at sales, you can bring in thousands, your marketing company can bring in thousands of patients for you, but you could lose them all. You would not be able to retain any of them because you were not able to sell your service to that patient. So the motivational mock-up is something that is very powerful in that part, and we'll talk about that even more. And then the online communication part, or the one of the true benefits of digital smile design is communication between you uh, and the rest of your clinicians, the rest of your team, as an interdisciplinary team, and the communication between you and your lab technician, which is even more and more important. And your lab technician is part of your team, whether you like it or not, because they are doing half the work for you. So you have to have, but they're not staying, they're not always an in-house lab. So you have to have a foolproof and a very easy way to communicate with them. So they do not have models going uh, back and forth. And then last but not least, the digital workflow, how we're able to implement digital smile design on all aspects of dentistry. And this is where we're going to show you through clinical cases. So beginning with the smile frame. Now, if you all look at this slide, okay, and you look at the model that we have in the middle of the screen. So this model here, if you can see my cursor, I think you can, right? Yes. This is what we do daily. What do we do? We have a case that comes in, patient wants to do veneers, oh wow, this is perfect. Let's do the this case. It's going to look beautiful. Um, what do we do? We take we take impressions of the uh, <coughs> sorry. We take impressions for the patient and we send them to our lab technician. And we ask our lab technician to do a wax up for us because this is what we were taught, and we know very well that the wax up is our treatment plan or this is our endpoint. But imagine put yourself now in the position of your lab technician, and another dentist has sent you a model. And hold that model in front of your hands and you tell me or try to do the wax up for that patient what information do you have there to be able to do this wax up? now imagine we have multiple spaces between the teeth where are we going to place the midline so simply your lab technician is going to put it yes ahmed do you have a question yes i have a question here regarding this point actually it's not my question it's a question of dr muhammad arif Yes. Uh, he is telling you, uh, uh, we are taking videos, emotional videos, and we are going to capture photos from these emotional videos to make this uh, 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 overlapping of the cast and the, and the teeth. Which or what kind of pose you want to give to the lab so he can I'm, superimpose? I'm, I'm, I'm coming that. Coming to that in the next slide, Dr. Mohammed. Okay. okay? That's okay. So we're coming coming to that to the next slide. So going back to the model that we have in our hands, we are now the lab technician. The patient has multiple spaces between the teeth. Now the first thing that we need to decide upon is where is my my midline? So the, the most logic way is to divide the space between the centrals into half, and this is going to be my new de dental midline. But is that the facial midline of the patient, does it have to do anything with the patient's facial midline? What if all the teeth were shifted to the right? And I made my midline between the teeth. What has that got to do with the patient's face? Nothing, okay? And then another question that their lab technician asks, and they always you always see them holding, holding their models, okay? And trying to adjust the horizontal of the model. Should I hold it to this side a little so I can't it to this side a little? They don't know. And the only way they can do this, or the only reference they have to do this is the teeth. 
they try to adjust the model so that the teeth are in the same occlusal plane. But what if the premolars on one side are over erupted than the other? Then he would totally rotate his model so that they could be in the same occlusal plane. But that's not right, is it? And then the other question they ask, should I open or should I close the buccal corridors? I don't know because I don't know where the cheeks are actually. Should I open or should I close? Should I make the teeth longer or should I make the teeth shorter? Again, I don't know because I do not have the relation of the lower lip while the patient's smiling. And I really don't know if the patient has a gummy smile or not. So there's tons of information that your lab technician does not know. So when you send this model to your lab technician, he's guessing, he's purely guessing. And our profession is not about guessing. We have a lot of information to be able to design perfect smiles for our patient. We have a lot of knowledge and skills to be able to do this, but you need to give enough information to your lab technician that he can do this wax up for you. So let's think in another way. What if I gave you both a photo and a model? Wouldn't that be better? Yes, it would. At least if you look at this photo of this patient, this patient has, <coughs> Sorry, a reverse curve. He has short teeth. I might need to plan to make his teeth a little longer incisal. He has a gummy smile in the posterior area. I might need to think of doing crown lengthening or making his teeth longer in the gingival in the posterior area. I can see that his midline is just a little off from his face, but how much off? How far is my dental midline from the facial? I don't know. So I have more information there, but is it 100% accurate? No, it isn't. How much longer should I make the teeth? I don't know. It's all an estimate, right? So if you send a model to your lab technician and also a photo, let's say on WhatsApp or whatever, uh, even if you took it with your phone and you send this to your lab technician, this is a little more information. But what if we looked at this slide here, this photo here with the model on top of the face? Now I know that I need to make the teeth longer and how much longer. Now I know where the midline should be and its relation to the face, to the facial midline. Now I know how much I need to close the buccal corridors or open them according to the patient's cheeks. Now I know when I do the wax up and I adjust my gingival margins, where the gingival margins are going to be in relation to the upper lip. I have all the information I need to give my patient the customized smile that he deserves, the smile that he has come to me to get from a professional dentist that has a lot of knowledge and has a lot of skill. The only reason patients come to you to get better or to smile better is not because they want a better set of teeth. It's really more psychological. They want to be more reassured. They want to be more confident because they feel that they cannot smile confidently. But what if they come to you seeking that and they get a set of teeth that have nothing to do with their face and they can't smile again, and they paid that much money. And we've seen this and we're seeing this these days, the number of patients that are going from dentist to dentist, from clinic to clinic, changing veneers and going and, and getting another set. It's just as if they're, you know, it's, it's a set of clothes that they're changing. So imagine the amount of, or, or what our patients need and always think of what our patients need and what we can do for them. So this is the whole concept of digital smile design, having the face, having the model on top of the face, overlapping them both on top of each other and doing my wax up accordingly so that I have a definitive wax up that looks perfect on my patient. And surprisingly, all of us have done smile designs at least once in our lives. Yes. Year three or year four ah, in our measure. university. Yes. Yes, Ahmed. This section, the, the, the section of prothesis. Yes, exactly. Yeah. The lovely section of confusion. Yes, that we we all loved. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We can't say anything about that because uh, huh? we, we have, have a, a lot of, of removal prosthodontists. <laughs> yes, right? they, they are our friends. <laughs> okay. So removal prosthodontists are the best smile designers, actually, and we have all done a smile design once in our life. You know why? Because uh -huh. that complete denture patient or fully edentulous patient, when he came into your clinic, there were no teeth there. And we have something that we're all used to. When you say hi to anyone for the first time, what do you do? You look at their teeth, right? That's the first thing you do. Why? Because you're a dentist. That's your profession, right? And we judge people with how their teeth look. But when the edentulous patient comes in, there are no teeth there. So the only landmarks you have at that time is the patient's face. 
And that's exactly what we were doing on the occlusion block. The visit when you took the primary, secondary impression, and now you have the bite, upper bite block in your patient's mouth, the wax rim. What did we used to do? We used to look for our patient's facial midline, right? The glabella, philtrum, and chin. And then we would draw a line or we'd carve a line on our occlusion block, a uh, vertical line, showing where the facial midline is. What does that mean? These lines that we carved onto the wax pattern or the wax block, we sent it to the lab later on, and that is a is is an is a landmark for the dental technician where to set the denture teeth exactly. That means that you want your midline to be here, and this is according to the face. So imagine the the way of that we used to communicate with our lab technicians when they used to do occlusion blocks. That's the same concept. That was perfect, but the only thing that we had at that time was the face, and that's why that was the only way. But that's what. That's what brings in smile design. That's what's the most important thing about it. When the patient comes in with teeth, do not look at the teeth, look at the face, relate the teeth to the face and plan accordingly. So what did we do? Next? The next step, we would also adjust our horizontal according to the pupils of the patient, according to our interpapillary line. And we would adjust the horizontal of the wax rim so that it would be exactly according to the horizontal of the interpapillary line. So that you remember the step where the lab technician would try to count the model. Now he doesn't have that problem anymore because he has a wax trim adjusted according to the face. Then we would ask our patient to say M, M, M sounds. Why? We wanted the patient's lip to be at rest. And we would look at the amount of exposure of the occlusion block while the patient is at rest. What would that show us? According to age, of course, and according to sex, but on average, we would, we would make our wax trim uh, visible or the amount of visibility of the wax trim to be two millimeters at rest. And what would that reflect where the incisal edges of the centrals would be? So we would make our occlusion block either longer or shorter according to the patient's lip while he's at rest so that we know where the incisal edge should be. So again, we are using the lips to know where the incisal edge position should be. And in the two steps before, we use the face to know where the vertical or the facial midline is and where the horizontal and adjusting the cant of our occlusion block. The third step, what would we do? We would adjust the curvature or what we call the smile curve now, the curvature of our occlusion block according to the patient smiling, according to the shape of the lower lip. So now we're adjusting also the shape of the occlusion block according to the lower lip, again, using the face. The next step, we would then either make our, our, our occlusion block wider or narrower according to the cheeks and their positions and the buccal corridors while the patient is smiling, again, using the patient's cheeks. And then from there, we would then relate where our gingival curve or our gingival margin is according to the patient's upper lip and also relate the inner cantus of the eyes and we would carve another line where the canine eminence is. And all of these landmarks that we were looking for with the complete denture patient, we would carve a line onto the occlusion block and this line would mean something to our lab technician, even if we didn't know what we were doing at that time. And most of us uh, didn't know actually that we were doing a smile design at that time. And from there, we would then bring in our gingival curve according to the upper lip while the patient is smiling so that we know we, where uh, the, the gum margin should be. And then we could measure the width of the teeth according to the height and then determine if we were giving an 80% ratio, height to width ratio for that patient or not. And then last but not least, we could also draw a, a last curve, which is, or the eighth curve, which is the papilla curve, where the papilla tips should be. And then imagine all these carved lines onto the occlusion block that you all did before. We would send this occlusion block uh, to our lab technician. And accordingly, he would only, we, would, we could also choose the shapes of the denture teeth that we use and the shade. And then he would just need to set those acrylic teeth onto the wax rim according to the design that we fabricate. All of this was an aesthetic design. All of this was a smile design. And then we would bring in the lower occlusion block, adjust our occlusal plane, our posterior occlusal plane of the upper, and then take our center correlation record. And then we would give the, the, the lab technician the occlusion or our functional side so that he can adjust also the upper and the lower. But we would all design the upper first and then adjust our bite according to the upper so that it would look good on the denture patient. And this is exactly what we want you to do or what we do with digital smile design. 
But the only difference is you do not have an occlusion block in your patient's mouth now that you can carve lines on. So when a patient comes in with teeth, I cannot carve lines on his teeth. I cannot draw with a marker and then take this as an impression and send it to my lab, can I? So the only way I can do this is digitally, meaning taking a photo of my patient in a certain head position, and we will talk about the head position or the photo that needs to be taken, taking an impression or taking a scan of my patient, and then I would superimpose both on top of each other, and then I would draw lines on my patient's face related to the teeth so that I can give the perfect plan to my lab. It's that easy. Exactly like the complete denture patient, just take a photo of your patient, draw lines on it. These lines are the exact lines that you used to carve on the occlusion block and send your lab technician. The photo with the lines is exactly what you're going to send your lab technician. He will then superimpose the model and do the wax up accordingly. So if you want to see how we do this with uh, digital smile design or the steps that we use for the smile frame, there is this is something that you all really need to understand. There's a 2D and a 3D part to it. Why do we call it 2D and 3D? 2D is because it's done on the photo. 3D is when it involves the model. <coughs> Sorry, and it involves a 3D software. So what we urge dentists to understand first and really master, and what you really need to do actually, is the 2D part. Because the 2D part is not sophisticated. It involves 2D softwares, which are much easier for you to use. They are not expensive. They are for free, actually. There are a lot of apps now that you can buy even to make your life easier. But the 2D part is very easy for the dentists. And we leave the 3D part for the lab technicians. Of course, if you're a dentist and uh, interested in doing the 3D part, this is up to you. But we always believe that spend more time as a clinician with your patients, okay, which is more profitable for you, and leave your lab technicians spend more time with the models and the scans, right? But if you have time for both, go ahead. So what I want to emphasize on is the 2D part involves us drawing lines on the photo exactly like the, the lines that we carved on the occlusion block as the complete denture patient. The 3D part involves taking the line, these lines to the model so that I can do my wax up. So let's go through the 2D steps, the steps that the dentist needs to do. So step number one is when we bring in a horizontal line. What we do actually, what you're going to see on my laptop now is what we do with any smile design. We take a photo of the patient with a full smile, Eyes have to be open because I need the pupils as a facial uh, landmark there. Both ears are equal on both sides so that I'm sure that my patient has not rotated his hand, his head, sorry, right or left. And the patient cannot look down or up too much because if when the patient looks down, I have a steeper smile curve. When the patient looks up, I have a reverse curve. So the patient has to be look straight ahead, eyes open, both ears equal on each side and the patient smiling as hard as possible. And of course, I have the video as a reference because the video will show me the true motion because the smile that the patient could give me could not be that full smile uh, that he is giving on the video, okay? So step number one, what do I do? I take that photo, I bring it into Keynote PowerPoint into an application. We have an application that we call the SD app now. We're going to take an idea about that also and how it simplified the process. You can bring this into Paint. Any software you want, uh, uh, you can use as long as you can draw lines in the photo, okay? So the first step is, and I bring in a true horizontal line and I start to compare this horizontal line to my patient's pupils, okay? And we also compare them to the intercommissures, okay? So the, to the commissures and to the pupils. And then I start to see if I need to rotate this photo or not, because there's a lot of times when you take the photo and the patient's head is rotated just a little, okay? So according to this photo, you can see that the interpapillary line is not exactly at the pupils of the patient's pupils and is not exactly at the commissures. So I need to rotate the photo just a little. So I rotate the photo so that I can adjust the horizontal of my patient's face. So what did I do now? When I rotated this photo, what's going to happen later on is the lab technician is going to bring in my model in that same position. So if I rotated the photo like this, the model is going to come in rotated. And if I rotated the photo like this, the model is going to come in the same alignment. So when I rotated the face, I have actually also rotated the model or adjusted the horizontal orientation of my model for my lab technician. So that's always step number one. Step number two is when we bring in our facial midline. And again, we are not looking at the teeth now. We are always looking and planning according to the face so that we can give our patient a customized smile that looks good on him 
And aesthetics is not about symmetry. It's about looking or blending in with the face, okay, to a certain extent, of course. So we are looking at now, looking for the glabella, philtrum, and chin. And we draw a vertical line crossing those three. We take the average of the three if they're not plane. And then we start to relate this to the dental midline. And this is when our aesthetic parameters that we all have studied before come in, meaning that these lines are not just drawn haphazardly like that, and that's it. When I bring in my facial midline and are related to the dental, what if my facial midline is not the same as my dental? I now have to decide, should I use my dental midline or should I use my facial? And this is where aesthetic parameters come in. And there is a parameter that says that if we have a, um, a shift or a difference between the dental and the facial midline, less than four millimeters go back to the dental. And there is why? Because if there's a difference less than four, you people cannot see this with their eyes. Okay, so um, there is an implication for this also because when I use, if I have a shift of two millimeters, imagine this, I have a shift of two millimeters between my dental and my facial midline and I'm doing, let's say, prosthetics for this patient. I will need to reduce one side more than the other. And this is where I come into biological issues also. So another thing you all have to be, uh, put in mind is smile design is not just about aesthetics. It's where you join aesthetics with biology and function the main triad of dentistry. And this is where you get the perfect treatment plan. Of course, there are certain things that you cannot see on the 2D photo you will need to see in the 3D plan. But when you join all three, this is when you give the perfect treatment plan for your patients. Because this is a mistake I did in the beginning. I used to do the perfect smile designs for the patients, and then they would turn out to be unrealistic. There's no way I can do this biologically or functionally for the patient. I learned it the hard way. So this is why I'm trying to show you the mistakes that I did before. So from there, the next step is we bring in our smile curve. And we said before, like the, we adjusted the occlusion block, it is a curve that should mimic as much as possible the shape of the lower lip while the patient is smiling. And this shows where my incisal edges of each tooth are going to be, meaning the incisal edges of the centrals, laterals, canines, fours, and fives. Now, no one look at where the patient's teeth are now. Imagine this face or this photo without teeth there. This curve that I have drawn will show the incisal edge of the central. The incisal edge of the lateral will be just a little shorter. The, the, the canine tip and the tips of the premolars, the amount of teeth that the patient shows while, while, while smiling. Okay, So this shape will show where my smile curve is, which shows the, the incisal edges of all the teeth. Now, this smile curve also has a position, meaning that if I bring this curve downwards right here the teeth would be longer and if i bring it upwards that means the teeth would be shorter and this is where we go back to the video because during the video when i was taking the video of the patient there was for sure a time when i when he was speaking and then he would uh he would stop and i would speak and when i would speak he would be at breast position this is a normal breast position and through the video i can see the amount of exposure that the patient had at rest at that time and decide whether i need to make these teeth longer or make them shorter. And then the functional issue would come in mind. What if I make the teeth longer? What is the overjet or the overbite that I have? Do I need to increase the vertical dimension or not? Do I need to intrude the lower anteriors or not? So every decision I make, there's an aesthetic, biological, and functional aspect to it. So to me, any patient that comes in, I start with the smile design because this is the basis of my, my treat plan. This is where all the ideas come in and start to brainstorm what would, what's the best, what would look best on the patient and what would give the best biological and functional results at the same time. Step five is where we bring in the canine eminence. Exactly as the complete denture patient, again, we would look at the inner canthus of the eyes and the width of the nose, and then we would draw a, a, a line or a vertical line onto the occlusion block. Here we are drawing line onto the photo so that we know where the canine eminence should be exactly. And when you look at this carefully, now we have our arch perimeter. <coughs> Sorry about that. Now we have our arch perimeter, we have our midline, and we can now start to divide the width of the total width of our teeth to give the width of the central, lateral, and canine. And this is where something called the interdental ruler comes in. Now, again, aesthetic parameters come in here. A lot of you know the golden proportion, of course, which is, the diff which is where we divide the width of the central, lateral, and canine. Mostly what we use now is the red proportion, where if we give 
uh, 100% to the central, we give 70% uh, of the width of the central to the lateral, and we give 50% of the width of the canine for the central meaning. For an example, if the width of the central is 10, then the width of the lateral will be seven, then the width of the canine would be five. And please put in mind the width of the canine is from the mesial of the canine to the canine eminence. And then we have a hidden part that we cannot see with our eyes when we look at our patient frontally, okay? So again, we bring in allure. What we used to do before in the analog world was we would look or we would start to, do, to, to measure our arch perimeter. We bring a ruler that you can bend and we would, we would uh, uh, measure our arch perimeter. And then we would give a width to the central first. And according to that width, we would do our golden proportion, the divisions or the red proportion with the equations. And we would give the width of the lateral and the width of the canine accordingly. And then we would find it doesn't work. So we'd give another width, a different width for the center. And then try it again. This would take at least a half an hour to 45 minutes if it was a difficult case. But what we have done here is within the digital world, this ruler is set already to the red proportion meaning that the width of the central is 100, width of the lateral is 70, width of the canine is 50, and this is fixed. No matter how wide or narrow you make this ruler, the proportions will stay the same. So all I need to do is bring in the ruler, adjust the canine eminence, adjust to the midline, and I have my widths according to the red proportion. And we don't need to do a lot of calculations because as a dentist, we're not so good at calculations, or at least I am not so good at calculations. So our next step is when we have the width of the teeth, now we need to know the height. And we have another uh, aesthetic parameter, which is the height to width ratio, which is ideally 80%, okay? And, sorry. <clears throat> Oops, need to go back. Which is ideally 80%, meaning that if the length of the central or the height of the central is 10, then the width should be eight. And we have a range from 75 to 85%. 75% meaning that if the height was 10, then the width would be 7.5. Uh, 85% would mean if the length was, or the height was 10, then the width would be 8.5. But what I have here is the width and I want the height. So it's, it's the ratio, it's that easy, it's the height to width. So if I have the width, I can get the height, it's that easy. And again, this is very simple in <clears throat> the digital format because you do not need to do all the multiplication and divisions or the cross multiplications to get, you no, know, you know the width and then you have to measure and then you bring in the height. You don't need to do that. If you have a box like this blue box, you can all see, this is a box that I have adjusted on 80%, meaning, and it's proportionate to each other, no matter how wide or how big or small I make this box, it will stay at 80%. So I adjust it to the widths of the teeth that I already have according to the interdental ruler or to the red proportion. I adjust it to my smile curve because I already know where the smile curve is and I've already decided. Then it would give me where my gingival curve is, meaning where my new gingival margins should be. And this is the next step. Now that I have my 80% box there, I can now bring in what we call a gingival curve. And this curve also, as much as possible, if you can, should mimic the shape of the, uh, uh, of the upper lip while the patient is smiling. And it shows me the gingival margin, the new gingival margin of each tooth. That simple. It shows me where the central should be, where the lateral should be, about one millimeter less, where the canine, where the four, and where the five should be. Our last step is the papilla curve. And <clears throat> this is a step that a lot of people miss. And this is very important step with uh, implant cases, because usually what happens is you a patient comes in, uh, uh, they want an immediate implant, let's say, or they just extracted the tooth, you place the implant there, and you haven't put into consideration where the papillas are, if you have a deficient papilla there or not. And if it's a single tooth, it's a disaster. And what happens then is that during the prosthetic phase, you're, you take the impression, you send this to your lab technician, and your lab technician has either two choices, to give you a black triangle or to give you a wider tooth that does not mimic the central on the side, which should be mirror image of each other. And then you start giving excuses to your patient. Oh, your gingiva, whatever happened to it, it shrunk during the surgery. So now we have to put pink porcelain in there, or now we have to do a second stage surgery so that we can adjust that papilla for you. Or you can just live with the white center that we did for you. Excuses, excuses, excuses. Why? Because we did not see the problem or the, mis or, or the deficiency we had from the beginning. Not that it's our fault, it's just we did not use all the visualization techniques that we had. And the papilla curve is very, very important in that point. The papilla curve should be at 30% of 
the length of the center from the gingival area, the range of 30% and the length of the center. Okay? okay? And the rest always follow. Um, before you ask the question, I'm just going to finish this part and then give you the chance to ask Ahmed. Okay, if that's okay. Yes, I Can think, as, as I told you, most of the questions are uh, are answered uh, during mm -hmm. the, the, the lecture. Itself. Perfect. Excellent, excellent. So if we all look at this close-up photo, this is actually the photo that you're going to send your lab technician. Okay, so let's go through this real quick. So this white line here with my mouse, it shows me where my dental midline is. Now, what I want you to do now, now we have two things, two very important things for a treatment plan. We have our starting point and we have our end point. What is our starting point where the teeth are now? What's the end point? The lines that I have drawn. So it's very easy for us all to treatment plan together now. You just need to really understand the lines and then I'll give you one minute to uh, all treatment plan the case, okay? So if we look at this central, where is my starting point, the incisal edge here? Where is the end point? This smile curve, okay? So that's one point. This is the smile curve. The smile curve shows where the incisal edges of all the teeth should be. That's one of the landmarks or the lines we have. What does this midline show or this white line? This shows where the midline of the teeth should be according to the face. What about these yellow lines, these yellow vertical lines? They show the width of each tooth, the width of the central, the width of the lateral, and the width of the canine to the canine eminence. What does this curve show? It shows where the papillas should be, where the papilla tip should be. And what does this last line here show? This shows where my gingival margin should be. So I'm going to give you all just one minute exactly. Now that you've understood where the lines are, you can see where your starting point and where your end point is. And if you would like to join in with a quick treatment plan for this case, please do really type in real quick because we don't have a lot of time. Now that you understood the lines, you can treatment plan this case very easily. Ahmed, you can hear me, right? Clear, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think we're, I'm looking at the, at, at the group now we're doing well, right? Yes. Okay. So do we have comments yet with the treatment plan? The comment, uh, I think it's, uh, okay. If you need the, the, the question is how to locate canine eminence again. Okay. So the canine eminence, usually you detect it with a facial landmark, which is the inner canthus of the eyes, okay, and the width of the nose. This is the average of where the canine eminence should be. This is not very important with a dented patient, actually. It's usually more important with fully edentulous patients because you need to know where the canine eminence should be according to the face. But when you have teeth there, you are really originally usually confined with the teeth that you already have. But uh, 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 what makes a difference actually with the canine eminence is uh, you could have a canine wider than the other and you would know that you need to equalize the canine eminence on both sides, meaning that the interdental ruler would already give you where your canine eminence is. And another question here, if, uh, I think he mean uh, if he needs a simple application for uh, a DSD application for a simple clinic, what, what do you advise him? I would advise you to, uh, if you have an iPad, uh, if you don't try to get one, uh, you can go on uh, on Apple Store and download DSD app by Coachman. That's the name, DSD app by Coachman. Uh, you can try it first for free uh, on two or, one, or two or three cases, and uh, it's 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 the whole concept. This is fabric. This is originated by Digital Smart Design and by Christine Coachman. And uh, it is the simplified process of the smile design done on iPad. It's very easy, very simplified, automated. There's a lot of artificial intelligence in it, meaning that the, the, the application itself uh, does most of the work for you, but you just adjust the lines and adjust the curves according to the case. And you can present the case very nicely. There's a presentation uh, platform on the app also. Uh, to show your patient before and after, it's, it's, it's beautiful actually to motivate your patients. Uh, we have another question, Mr. Mahmoud. Uh, what's the difference between normal cast and 3D printing cast? And what are Ahmed, I can't hear you very well. Okay, someone is uh, Dr. Mahmoud, Dr. Mohammed Magdi is asking, What's the difference between normal cast and 3D printing cast? 
And what's what the difference are, between a normal cast and a 3D printed cast? Yes, and right? what are the usage of 3D printing cast in TSD? I mean, if, if okay, we have, so, so if our, we have the our, STL file, why would I print it? Okay, so what I understood, uh, because uh, Ahmed's uh, uh, cutting off a little, the internet's not that good, but what I understood from the question, please tell me if I'm right or not. You want to know the difference between a traditional wax up on a model, on a stone model? Yes, and yes. A digital wax up and a 3D printed model and a wax up exactly. done on the model. Okay, exactly. so exactly. what we used to do years ago, about seven to eight years ago, uh, ago when we, when Christian first started uh, doing smart designs and, and relating them to the model, was we would do the 2D smile design on the photo, as you can see, and then we would take measurements on those, that 2D photo and carry those measurements to a stone model and then do our wax, okay? But this would not give us 100% accuracy. But that was, sorry, the only way then, because the 3D softwares were not ready for the idea of the 2D smile design. Christian was way ahead of a lot of software companies. But as soon as, the idea of the 2D and reflecting, or let's say transferring this 2D smile design to a 3D model was made possible by, uh, by software companies, it became even more accurate. Why? The next step that I'm gonna show you is we're going to automatically on the software, bring in the model in the same position of the face exactly, and the lines that you have drawn will be on the model while the wax up is being done. So you will imagine this even more in the upcoming slides. I'm just giving you an idea that this is what we used to do because softwares are not ready, okay? And you cannot also, in the, in the traditional wax up, you can't control shapes. Meaning that the te dental technician that did the wax up for you, when he did the wax up with those certain uh, shapes that he gave you with his hands and the texture he gave to the teeth, he will not be able to copy 100% to the finals because manipulating ceramics is not like manipulating wax. That's one thing. Another thing is, Lab technicians, when they do wax ups, and this is a study that was done years ago, most lab technicians, the masters, the best lab technicians in the world usually have two to three shapes fixed in their mind. So if you look at wax ups of one dental technician, you will, or let's say 30 to 40 models, you'll find two to three main shapes that are used for all patients, females or males. But when you do that, a digital wax up digitally, then you have a library of shapes. You can have more than 50 shapes if you want, what we do now is we started with the Jan Hatch two shapes, which were natural shapes or the uh, skin models, okay? But what we do now is any patient that I see or anyone I see actually, even a friend I see I, uh, and I like the way his teeth look and I like the natural texture that's on his teeth. I tell him, please pass by the clinic. I scan him and I can use the scans of his teeth for someone else. So what are we doing now? we're giving na even more natural smiles to our patients because this is the trend that is going worldwide and this is actually our job as dentists we were not our profession was not to give our patients artificial smiles our profession is to give our patients back what they have lost meaning patients that have lost the ability to smile confidently want to smile once more or they have lost teeth let's say or by time their teeth were worn down or their smile is, for any hereditary reason, they have a gummy smile or whatever, they can't smile confidently anymore. We're giving them back that smile, giving them back a natural smile, as much as possible as what has God had given them, as much as possible. Of course, we'll never reach to God's creation, but we're giving natural smiles to our patients. And this is a trend worldwide. I know that a lot of our patients are still looking for those super white teeth. And actually, it's not about shade, it's not about color. Every patient, has the right to get a natural, uh, uh, brighter smile. If I thought of doing my teeth, I would look for a brighter shade. All of us would think that way, even dentists, right? It's not about the shade. It's about the texture. It's about the shapes. It's about the natural positions of the teeth with the face that they blend in. It's a mixture of a lot of things, okay? I got you. Should we go on, Ahmed? Yes, yes, sure. Perfect, okay. So. Uh, the, the whole point of this past slide is I wanted you all to see that you would be, have the ability to treatment plan this case very easily. And the, every one of you would give a different treatment option than the other. But given that you have now the starting point and the end point, the visualization of the case is totally different. So let me go through this real quick. <clears throat> this lateral, the gingival margin is at the higher level of my gingival curve. I have many options. Periodontist would say, let's go for a gingival graft. And he would start to access the case if it could do that 
or not. I would I could think of pink porcelain. Let's say if we're going to do a veneer on this uh, on the central, someone would think of ortho uh, extrusion so that we can bring the gingival level to a lower level, especially that we have the papilla deficient here according to the papillary level. But then what would happen is we would have the incisal edge here at a lower uh, at a lower level than the smile curve. We would need to, we need to reduce this teeth tooth even more and we would, might need to go for a cram because we might go into dentine than enamel. See just that lateral. With those three lines, the amount of treatment plans and the treatment options I was able to give and brainstorm through that so quickly. That's the whole point of visualization and seeing your, your starting point and having your end point there. Okay, because at the time I will not complete treatment planning the case, but of course we have a very large, a huge deficiency of gingiva and papilla here. So most probably we would go for a hybrid prosthesis for this patient. And this patient is one of the patients that you'll see during the motivational mock-up and we went for a full arch implants because the four anteriors were non-restorable once more, they were periodontally affected, okay? So <laughs> what were we doing here? We were making smile design decisions through facial dynamic analysis. Facial because we have the photo there and we drew our lines on the photo. Dynamic because we have the video as a reference and we're always looking at the video to see the true smile of the patient. What else? We have a 3D understanding of what we need to do for this patient using 2D images, or at least for now, because we will have more information, of course, with the 3D. And we are helping our eyes to see more so that we can make better smile design decisions. Meaning, our eyes are trained to compare things to each other, okay? So I have this, this example, okay? So if it's the first time, in your life to see any lady in the world. She would be the most beautiful lady in the world, right? But if you saw 10, then you would start comparing them to each other. This is how we learn, right? And this is how we were taught to, taught to learn as babies. We compare things to each other. So when you have lines over the photo, even the, the most minute deficiencies in the papilla or the gingival margin, up to 0.1 to 0.2 millimeters, you can see because you have a line there that shows you where you are and where you want to be where your starting point is and where your end point is. So it's easier for you to see the defects. So that is the 2D stage. This is the stage that all of you learn, need to learn to do very easily. It's a simple process. Uh, we used to do workshops that used to take a whole day so that we can get that done. The course that you talked about, uh, Ahmed, that we did with Christian, the, uh, the world tour that was here in Egypt at that time, the workshop was a full day. Now we do the workshop in less than one hour. We do it in a most simplified process. Of course, the app makes it much easier. It's much, much easier now because a lot of people used to be frustrated. We use less images. It's much, it's a more easier process. And this is what happens by time. So the 2D process is where you take a photo using a DSLR camera or the frontal uh, face while the patient is smiling real hard. And then you put this onto, on the DSD app or any software you like, PowerPoint, Keynote, whatever, Photoshop even if you want, and you draw lines on it. And these lines are put according to the aesthetic parameters that we have all uh, understood uh, before. They're not just put haphazardly. We think biologically, aesthetically, and functionally. And accordingly, this photo we take a snapshot of and we send to the lab. The next step or the 3D part is the lab steps. So what happens in these steps? And this is the step that the doctor that was talking or asking about the printed mock, right? So the first thing the lab technician does, you send the snapshot of your patient's photo with the lines on it. He imports first the photo with the lines. This is the photo, me as a dentist, that I sent to my lab technician. He imports this into his 3D software. And then he also imports an STL. This is the format of a scan. Uh, either you have an intraoral scanner and you sent it to him, or you sent, you took an impression, you sent it to your lab, he poured it into stone model, and he scanned it for you, whatever. He put both onto the software. This as an STL and this as a JPG. This is just the format, right? And then... What happens next is he starts to register or align them to each other, meaning the, the photo and the scans are in different places in space, right? He brings them on top of each other exactly in the same position. And this is where softwares differ from each other. The lab softwares or the 3D software, sorry, differ from each other. There are softwares that you can align a 2D photo or register a 2D photo to the model very, very accurately. And softwares that show that they can, but they, unfortunately, they can't. Okay, it's not that accurate. So you have to be very picky with the lab that does this for you because not any software, you cannot do this on any software 
when we see a lot of uh, people talking about alignment between 2D and 3D uh, in that part, uh, but not all softwares work. Okay, so please put that in mind. So what you can see here is the model is on top of the face, right? Exactly in the same position of your patient's teeth on the photo. So that's why it's very important that when you take the photo, you take it with the DSLR, this DSLR camera with a professional flash and a macro lens. Why? We want very, very good on the teeth and we want the resolution to be very good so that we can align or register this very accurately. Because I cannot, if I cannot see the teeth well, I cannot register also accurately. Okay? So what happens next? If just imagine that your lab technician deletes the photo and what was going to stay, what's going to stay is just the model with the lines on it. So what I have here is the photo, the lines and the model, right? Delete the photo, what's going to stay is the model and the lines. And what are these lines? These lines are a reflection of the facial dynamic analysis that I did on my patient's face. It's where I want to be. And where, who have I given this information to? I've given this to my lab technician. Now, so simply, my lab technician, when he has this model with the lines on it, he does not need the face anymore because the lines translate exactly the plan from the face. And the next step is for my lab technician just to choose the shapes from the library. And these are natural shapes once more with natural texture so that we can give our patients natural smiles. I've already said the value of this. He just puts in or aligns the teeth or the shapes we have according exactly to the lines that you have drawn. So what happened here? You have directly communicated with your lab. You have directly controlled your lab in every single step of this wax up. You have told them exactly where to place the teeth. And what's more perfect is this digital wax up is what's used for every single step later on. It's what's used for your implant planning. If you want to plan or surgically plan for an implant, a guided surgery, this wax up is going to be used because it's the facial dynamic analysis of the face and we can adjust. And your lab technician, if he has the lower, he can also adjust occlusion. So it's according to occlusion also. So this implant is going to be placed according to a facial prosthetic plan. If you want to do ortho orthodontic alignment and you don't want to bring in artificial shapes. This is also possible. You can move the teeth on the aligner software according to the smile design. And this is done on uh, with Invisalign now. The DSD app is directly connected to Invisalign. And you can do this also on other softwares, on other 3D softwares if you have them. And if you can align the 2D to the 3D. You can also plan for uh, uh, increase of vertical dimension. You can increase the vertical dimension on the software and adjust the teeth accordingly. You can you can plan for an orthognathic case. You can plan for a gummy smile case, for crown lengthening, let's say. You can plan for Botox. You can plan for every single thing you can imagine. You can even plan for composites if you want. You can plan for your veneers, of course. So this is where, this is where the, the, the big change happened, where we were able to use 3D softwares to register the 2D photo with lines on it to digital uh to a digital format to digital scans or stls of our models on the software so that is 100 percent accurate and now there's no place for faults and you can see a simulation of how it's going to look on your patient so it's a facially guided digital wax up now this model when it is 3d printed then you have a 3d printed model of that wax up, okay and this is the issue that we're coming in in the next steps so from this digital wax up as i said there are three R's in dentistry. Don't think anywhere else, okay? If you want to do anything to your patient's teeth, there are three main ways. You can either relocate, relocate, which is either by ortho or orthognathic, using the same shapes. Now, if you look here, this is exactly the same uh, case. We did the smile design. This patient, we, we gave her several treatment plans. According to the facial guide that smile design, we took this to our ortho aligner software. We started to move the same teeth on the aligner software according to the smile design. So this is a facially guided ortho treatment, okay? You can reshape using new shapes for this patient because this patient has uh, uh, a partly gummy smile, I think. No, this wasn't a, yes, it was, a, no, she didn't have a gummy smile, but we use new shapes with, which are natural shapes in our library and the shapes were placed according to these lines and the smile design, or you can restore, which is restorative or perio or implants. Do we have any other 
disciplinary and dentistry? No, we don't. So you can either relocate, reshape, or restore. And the facial guided smile design will help you for every single step that you want to do 3D for your patient. So with this facial integration, you will have less intraoral adjustments, less aesthetic adjustments also, and you will be able to give your patients a mock-up, which is what we always show our patient before we start. After this wax-up, this wax-up is transferred to a mock-up, which is put in the patient's mouth, and we take a second video of our patient and we show our patient a before and after, so that we can bring in the patient's perspective of the design also. Because just imagine that you are the, uh, if that you, your, let's say your mother was the one that was choosing your clothes for the past 10 years. How would you feel? It's the same with the dentist. Yes, you are a dentist. You have the information. You have the knowledge. You should help your patient to design, to put the preliminary design. But your patient has to be, has to be also partly in control of his design. He should be able to be the co-author, let's say, as we say, of his smile. He should be able to implement what he would like to have uh, the shapes or whatever to choose the shapes or the directions or the positions of his teeth, but according to your, under your supervision, because of course they do not have the knowledge that we have. To be able to do that, you need to show them a mock-up first and they have to imagine how this is going to look on their face. This is their right. And given that you are able to uh, determine and, and, and give them uh, 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 the warranty that the finals are going to look exactly as the mock-up and the mock-up will look exactly as the provisionals and they will look exactly as your final restorations as long as you're doing or using the digital workflow or you're doing this on digital softwares and this is another advantage of course than the analog wax up according to the question that we're asked. Now if you all look at this case this is a case where we did uh, this is the patient's pre-op on the left and the patient's test drive or the mock-up, and these are the patient's finals. The mock-up is exactly the same as the final ceramics that we gave our patient. And what we showed the patient during the test drive is what the patient got during the finals. And this is what we call predictability. And this is what we are all, what we should all be doing for our patients. And this is something that patients love actually. Now, when you think of architects that build skyscrapers that are, 100 to 150 stories high. What did they do first? They show uh, uh, they show you a mannequin, right? And they do this in 3D or in 2D sometimes. And then after three to four years of building this huge skyscraper, they show you they show you a building that looks exactly the same as they showed you in the mannequin. And they're building a 150 story building. And we can do that with just a few teeth. We can, but we just need to use the technology, yeah? Dr. Mahmoud, right. we have a question so, regarding this point. Ahmed, are you still Hello? there? Yes, I'm talking to you. We have a question Perfect. regarding the previous slide from Dr. Hisham Amr. Yes. He was asking about the the, the mock-up, uh, virtual mock-up in video. Is it available okay. or not yet? Yeah, coming. Coming in the next slide. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. Okay. So... <clears throat> This 2D smile design that we did, it has five main advantages. To me, it is a treatment planning brainstorm because to me, this is where my first, my treatment plan begins. This is where I get a huge idea of the case and what it needs. It is an interdisciplinary communication tool. Like we all saw that photo with the lines on it, we will, can all get up with a treatment plan and we can communicate with each other as long as we understand what the lines mean. <clears throat> you can use it as a treatment plan presentation. And this is where we bring in the next subject that we're going to talk about where we bring the patient into trusting us so that they would go for the full treatment. We use it for a mock-up strategy and we use it with 3D softwares. Now, one of the best parts that I love about Smile Design is the motivational mock-up, okay? And this is a huge part of um, patient acceptance, right? And this is something I, I learned also, again, experienced and nearly the hard way, okay? so. At the time, I had a lot of patients coming in, right? And these patients, I had to sell my product or my services to them. Yeah, 70, let's say 50 to 60% would go for the treatment plan that I would give them. Another 50 would walk away. But these are patients that you are losing, right? This is revenue for your clinic. So I started to understand a little more patient psych psychology, right? The patient, just imagine the patient that's coming into your clinic, okay? He is an anxious patient who feels that you're going to do two things to him, right? 
He is already mostly in pain because mostly patients come to us when they are in pain and then they think about cosmetics and whatever. He is in pain already and he knows that you're going to make him feel even more pain. Okay, so you you are a pain provider, right? That's number one. Number two is he has a certain sum of money in his pockets, right? And he knows that you are going to snatch all that money out of his pockets. Okay, so this is this is what patients think, right? Uh, they're coming to you anxious about two things. They're going to feel tremendous pain, okay? Or more pain than, they, than the, what they are, are in right now. And you're going to try to snatch all the money that they have in their pockets. So imagine that person coming into your clinic, the perspective he has about you. How many times have you met a patient for the first time and he told you, Doc, I hate you. I've heard that nine out of 10 times out of every patient that comes in, right? And if we say it in Arabic, uh, or, or if we translate it, I have nothing against you as a dentist, but I hate dentists. That's when they try to be, you know, just a little, not really direct and rude in your in your face. Uh, uh, that's what we all hear. They really hate us. Because that's the perspective that they have about us. And for you to be able to sell a service or a product for any customer, you need to get a patient to like you first and then trust you, right? But our patients come in hating us first. We have to take them from the hate to the like, to the trust. So we have to be the best salesperson in the world to be able to persuade our patients to do Yes, if he's in pain, he, you're the only solution that he has, right? But when you want to do cosmetic work, let's say, this is something that you really need to be good at, at selling so that these patients would go for the treatment and pay that large sum of money to you, giving that they already know that you're trying to snatch that money out of their pockets, right? So to me, the emotional approach of dentistry or the motivational mock-up is the perfect solution to get our patients to like us of course liking uh comes in different ways in the beginning how uh you are you're you they are um treated by the secretary from the beginning of the set to create the smell of the how, the how the office smells if you serve them coffee or tea or not the level of coffee and tea that you give them the level of music that you have in the area if you have a massage chair or a spa experience there them not feeling that they're in the clinics the first impression is always important and then when they see you, the first impression from you, and they start to like you, okay, and then they have to come to the trust, trust parts that they can go for the treatment. So the emotional dentistry concept is about engaging, motivating, and increasing the perceived value of a dental treatment. The main problem or the main idea why our patients uh, think that we are too expensive, all patients think that dentists are too expensive, okay, is because they do not value what we are giving them, right? So we want them to actually value what we are giving them. Now, the only way for them to value is to, to, to talk to them in a language that they would understand, right? So imagine two scenarios, showing your patient a wax up on a model or telling your patient or trying to discuss with your patient your treatment planning, tell him that we're going to place implants here and we're going to do a gingivectomy here and we're going to do a crown lengthening here and we're going to remove bone around your tooth from here and we're going to drill into your jaw bone and place an implant there. And we might need to even elevate your sinus. And we're going to remove tons of, uh, a little bit of the tooth structure of your tooth so that we can do a veneer for you. So this is what how patients perceive the information that we give them. Or think of showing the patient how he or she could look at the end. Okay, so this is mostly the difference between our sales process. So let's all imagine that, let's say, us guys, when we go into, let's say, uh, a showroom, right? A very nice big showroom with a bit of, of a big car company. We all love uh, cars, and this we we do uh, a lot of times. All of us go go in as friends uh, to look at this fabulous new model that we heard of, the sports edition car that's in the in the showroom. What happens there? We go into the showroom. The first thing that happens is it's super big. It's super shiny. The cars are are waxed. They have certain lights that you can see the the bright reflection of the light of the of the cars. The smell of the of the showroom is pure leather, which we all love. Usually, when you go in 
they leave you to wander around as much as you want. No salesperson approaches you because they want you to, they want to see where you would direct yourself to, which car you like. And as soon as you go to that car that you are very interested in, what do they do? They leave the doors open. And even someone could come up and just open the door for you. And then they ask you to step in. And when you step in, you smell the, the, the sweet smell of the leather. You start to get interested more, the, the, the smell that we all love. And when we buy a new car, we don't, we don't have any cigarettes or cigars in the car because we don't want the smell to go away, right? All of us are that way. And then he sits beside you. He puts the first ignition on. And then you start to see the lights. He starts to show you the options. You start to get even more interested. Your eyes start to glare at all the options and the lights that are in the car. They put the car on sometimes even. They put the engine on and they have and they make the glass of the of the or the or the area in the showroom so that the cars really roar real real loud because we love that. What are they doing? They are motivating you even more and more to love this car. And then they ask you if you'd like to go for a test drive. And the first question that you ask when they tell you that, how much? And when you say how much, they say it's for to totally for free. And when you hear it's for free, you're like, wow, that's amazing. Let's do it. Even if you have something to do at that time, you would go down there to the garage because you know that they're going to give you the best sport edition car of that model of that car. And if you're abroad uh, and you're doing the test drive, a beautiful monument would sit beside you. They would play the music that you like because the music you like always has a very nice memory in your head and that's going to play back with that music. And then they would make you go through the most beautiful roads in that area so that you don't go through a lot of bumps, smooth roads with a lot of trees and something really beautiful so that you can really feel the experience. And by the time you are driving that car and the music is playing and that beautiful woman is sitting beside you, the only thing you can imagine is yourself in that car every single day, going to work in the morning into that car, showing it off to your friends, going at night or imagining passing by your wife or your girlfriend and going to that fabulous really chic restaurant in the hotel and going and parking in front of the uh, in front of the uh, in front of the hotel with that beautiful car going to the cafe with uh, with your friends at night and showing off your car yes we all do that we all look for social acceptance at the end with the beautiful things that we have but you have been put in the position that you can only the only thing you can do imagine yourself in that car as if that car was yours and then by that time they start to tell you, we have to go back to the showroom. And then what are they doing? They make you feel that you they are taking away that fabulous feeling that you had for the past two to three minutes of you in that car, imagining yourself driving that car every day. Now what are you going to start thinking of? I want that experience back. So you're going to start thinking of a way or ways of paying for that super expensive car that you actually don't even have a penny for, even if your wife, just last night had a fight with you because he wanted more money. You would actually think of a way of paying for that car. They would put you to that extent. They would motivate you to that extent. And sometimes if you're crazy, really, you would do it. And you would ask if they could install that money or that amount for you. We were all put in that situation before. And every single person in the world, every decision you make in your life is driven by emotion. And that's what they have done exactly. They have motivated you emotionally to get to the point that you would love to have this experience once more. The same with the girls. When they go into any jewelry shop, what happens? They have everything in glass, super shiny, super lights, and they let you come in. And when you ask to look at something, they don't tell you, no, you can't touch. No, they bring it out for you. And once you look at the string that you really like and you put it on, uh, on your finger, the first thing you do is you start looking and imagining and then taking photos, taking selfies, sending it to your mom, sending it to your husband, sending it to your friend to motivate you even more, sending it to the person that's going to pay for that ring and trying to motivate him or her to pay for that beautiful ring that you, re that you really love. Why? You experienced it on your hands. You, you were put into the situation that you felt that this is, this is exactly the same experience we want to put our patients in. That is the easiest way to make your patients go from hate to like to the beginning of trust. That they see what you can do for them, that they imagine themselves in the situation that these are the things that I've been waiting for for so long. This is what's going to give me back my confidence. This is what's going to 
make me be able to smile freely in front of my coworkers. This is what's going to, that's been putting me back so much time with presentations and my work for so long. This is what's been making my life a misery with my husband or with my fiance because I can't smile in photos. This is the, 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 this is going to solve the problems that I have with taking selfies with the rest of my friends. Yes, these are all true stories of patients that have gone through this misery of not being able to smile confidently. Once you give them that, you show them the mock-up. And when we show the mock-ups, we show a video of before and after so that they can compare between their life before and their life now after with the mock-up and how it's going to be. And they start imagining what they can do with this beautiful smile. Imagine then after that, when you talk about the treatment plan, you then give them logistics. You then tell them, yes, you need a crown lengthening here. You need an implant. You need a, you need whatever. They don't care. They don't care how much time it's going to take. They don't care the amount of the procedures. They actually sometimes, a lot of times, don't care the amount of cost, but a few tips that they don't care about cost anymore. And they will go for the treatment because you have motivated them and you have put them into the situation that they have felt how their life is going to change with the simple mock-up that you put in their mouth and you make them experience. But you need a few tricks to be able to get this wow effect that we've been talking about. The first thing is you start with the photos. What I do now as an easier protocol for myself is I only take the frontal smile photo because this is the most important photo and this is where 90% of the design is done. I use the profile photo when I have patients with protruded teeth so that I can see the uh, effect on the upper lips. And when I need also sometimes to adjust occlusal plane, I do not use the occlusal or the 12 o'clock photos anymore because I can see this with my lab technician on the 3D part. So what I recommend or what I use in my hands is the frontal smile photo only to make the procedure even worth or uh, much easier. I then do my smile design for my patient. I then after that do the widget, the, send it to my lab to do the digital wax up for me. When I receive my 3D printed model for my lab technician, all I have to do is fabricate a silicon key on it. This is with additional silicon. And then I inject uh, temporary crown material. We usually use bleached crown and bridge temporary crown material so that because every patient wants a lighter color, of course, you can give the patient to motivate a different or a darker color. And then you put this in your patient's mouth. Of course, the silicon index is done in a certain way so that you do not have any excess material in the patient's mouth because the experience here is very important, meaning that when you do this with your patient, the day how we do this with our patients, actually, we do this with every patient that comes in, even if they don't ask for the treatment, if they haven't asked for cosmetics, because the patient who has asked for an aesthetic treatment is easy to persuade. He's the one who's coming for it. But we do this with every patient that comes in the clinic, even the patient that's come for a normal scaling or a normal thinning, okay? When we finish the filling and we usually try to have a second visit that we need to check up on the patient once more or finish the procedure itself, we tell the patient we have this new technology that we're using, it's called Smile Design. How about we show you how your new smile could look? The first question is, how much? And your first answer is, it's for free. And if you tell me, yes, this, but this is going to cost some money in the lab, every one of us has the marketing budget, use your marketing budget on patients that already like you and trust you. It's much easier to persuade those patients for aesthetic treatment plans or aesthetic work than patients that already don't know you, okay? So put part of your budget for persuading and motivating patients that you already have, right? Then what happens next? Usually you take them to the studio or you take photos of them in the clinic and videos and you tell them we're going to see you next week and we're going to show you how this is going to look. Now, if she's mostly, they're usually ladies, but a lot of men have been asking for this right uh, now and we do this a lot, but ladies mostly, she's already, you've already taken a photo and a video of her when she was off guard. She didn't know she was going to uh, get photographed, but she knows next week that you're going to take a photo and video for her. So, so naturally she has her hair done. She has the makeup done, everything, because she knows you're going to take a photo again. Every lady loves her, loves to take a photo, loves, loves to take, uh, for, for someone to take a photo of her, right? So by then you send the things to the lab, they do the digital wax up for you, you have the printed models, you do the silicon index, patient comes in the second time, greeted very fast, sitting in the, in the waiting room, she cannot wait for a long time. This is very important because the motivation is how you present, how you do the work of course, but how you present and, and keeping your patient on the right side of the brain. Meaning we have two sides of the brain, the right and the left. The right is the emotional side which involves music and all the emotions that we want the patient to feel when we show the mock-up. 
the left side is the logic side which is how much how many why when yeah the left side uh, to us as men is our wives right that's always nagging of the logic and we are the, always the dreamers think of it that way so you always want the patient on the right side so any unpleasant experience during the second visit this patient is going to shift to the left straight away and you want the patient to shift to stay and on the right side so patient is greeted patient cannot wait you have to have everything ready she's put onto the uh, in the dental chair real quick and you do this uh, mock up very quickly without using a turbine or a handpiece because once they hear the handpiece they shift to the left straight away so you the silicon index is cut in a special way so that all the excess material is automatically and you do not need any adjustments and it turns out perfect because we use uh uh um, natural tooth shapes and you have the texture there it looks really natural then you take the patient to the studio and then you start to take a second video we do not show the patient the mock-up in the mirror this is super important why when the patient looks in the mirror they look at very fine details and when they're looking at these details they will see the defects in the temporary crown material but when you show them on a large screen the larger the screen the better and you play some music like the experience with the showroom and you show them a before and after so that they can relate where they were and where they are now what they used to feel and where their emotions are taking them now and dreaming of now it's totally different so you have to have it on a screen with a video two photos okay i love videos more because they show real motion and the patients get really emotional when they see their lips moving around the mock-up three very important points you have to do before you show the mock-up to the patient tell the patient what to expect meaning the bisacrylic material is usually sour so tell the patient this is going to feel a little sour okay usually the wax up or the the motivational mock-up is not adjusted according to occlusion because everything comes to the outside on top of the patient's teeth so we cannot adjust it functionally so you will tell the patient you will not be able to bite on this this has nothing to do with your bite it will be adjusted later on okay and tell your patient that you might feel that it is a little bulky because for me to be able to show you this it has to be an additive process or it has to be additive on top of your teeth if you tell your patients those three things then the patient won't stay on the chair when you're taking the video keep asking you why do i feel that it's sour why can't i bite why do i feel that it's pushing my lip to the outward to the outside tell patients what to expect then you will be able to motivate them very well play music that they like you'll be able to motivate even more because there's a memory that comes with the music that they like. Always ask them the music or let the secretary ask them the music they like, right? So a few tips of how to really get this done right, because this is the, the way actually to do it. It's not just about putting the mock-up in the patient's mouth, there's a certain skill to it. So what I'm going to do next is show you guys just a few patients that I have done mock-ups for, okay? And what I'm showing you here is I'm filming them with a third camera, okay showing their experience with the walk-up so this is the patient that you saw uh, me doing the 2d smile design for and we show them a photo of himself on the mobile real quick so that he can give us his experience and what you're going to see now is his ra him raising his three fingers saying now i'm going to get married to three women okay this is a an old man that needed full arch implants and didn't have that much money this patient went totally crazy overseeing her mock-up now every single patient will give you a different perspective than the other according to her background she's a gummy smile case and you will see her case later on and you will see the transformation actually that we're able to give her in her life okay another patient with uh missing teeth in the in, a, in the middle of course this patient was very easy to motivate and as soon as she saw the mock-up she started crying and then she started laughing and then she started crying again Every single patient will give you a totally different uh, perspective according to our background. This case was a superb case because this was a gummy smile case. And this patient actually, we were filming her because we were trying to document this case from the beginning to the end with a professional team. And the mock-up that we showed her, when we were showing her the mock-up, she was surrounded by 10 cameramen in the studio, okay? And she was feeling so many emotions when she was watching but she was trying to hide it from all of us. Now you'll see that she has just seen the two videos were, uh, playing in front of her. She's trying to hide what she's feeling and she's trying not to show it because she knows that we are filming here. 
She's trying to head, hide her head. She's trying to hide her eyes. And in a few moments, she will come to the extent that she has so much, so many emotions inside her that as you can see, she's going to start to have teary eyes. She's going to burst into tears and she will stay doing that for three or four minutes more to the extent at, at the end, she told us, please, enough, I cannot take any more. See, she has burst into tears now and then she will go into further emotions. After that, if you look at the photos, this is when she first saw it. Of course, this was a big surprise to her. And then she started getting watery eyes. She's trying to hide all the feelings that's inside her. She's come to the extent that she cannot hide it anymore. She's going to burst into tears. And then she starts laughing and crying and laughing and crying again. And this is her at the end. Please, this is enough. I can't take any more. This is a case I really like. This is a case that we, uh, sorry, let me just uh, stop the music. Okay, so this is a case that we did recently in MSA University. Uh, and this patient, we uh, did a live mock-up for her. It was in front of about 150 participants, students from MSA. And look at uh, this, uh, her reaction to the mock-up. So this is her in the group of people sitting down. And this is when she first saw her simple photo before and after, there was no videos. And then everyone, was happy about the result and look her burst into tears when she saw the results. She could not imagine. We had not started any type of treatment yet. And this is her intern that was supposed to finish her case for her, right? Imagine crying in front of 200 people, getting that much many emotions that you cannot hide it in front of everyone. So this is the type of experience that you want every single patient to go through. And this is what's going to transform your patient from a patient that likes you to the patient that's starting to trust you. And this is the point where this is the best time where you can start giving the full treatment plan and giving the cost to the patient with total confidence because you have already seen the reaction in your patient's eyes. You have seen the feelings that your patients have gone through, the emotions that you have, your patients has gone through, the how much she loves or she has loved the experience that she's in. And you have already also done something very important, taken the mock-up out of her mouth. Because they have to understand that this is something temporary. This is not something that they can stay with because it's not good for, or for their function and occlusion. Because you have to take away or take away or give them the, the, the feeling that this is needs to be taken off. Okay. We give our patients a video of before and after on WhatsApp. We send that to them because. Every patient always wants to ask a friend. She wants to ask her mother. She wants to ask the father. You need also to motivate not only the person that's doing the treatment. You need to motivate also the person that's going to pay for the treatment. And this is where, you, when you understand that this patient has someone else that's making the decisions for them, this is the point where after the mock-up straight away, I seat them on my laptop for 45 minutes to one hour, and I start to communicate with them. I start to show them the real 3D plan because my lab sends me snapshots and videos of the 3D plan of the whole case that we have done. If it involves implants, orthognatic, ortho, veneers, whatever you can think of, perio, anything you can think of, they send me snapshots that I can make patients understand exactly what we need to do to give her that result. And surprisingly, when they see this on the 3D softwares, they are amazed. They love what they are seeing. Why? Because this is the first time for them in their lives for a dentist actually to make them understand what they need. And the only reason that they understand more this time is because they can visualize also. It's all about visualization. So once you have that visualization and you give that visualization, visualization to your patient and you show your patient, look, we have an implant here, but to place that implant, I need to do a sinus lift. And they're like, yeah, okay, why not do it? Because why? Because they understand now. They really start to trust you because you have given them all the information that they need so for them to really believe that every single thing that you are doing for them, they need. It's not something that they're just paying money for and that's it. And that's when they really understand. They come to the point where they understand that you really know what you're doing and you're giving them steps for every single thing that's going to be done and a time limit for everything and a price for everything. And they don't care about the price now because they have never felt this experience 
with any other dentist. So this is the true value to me of becoming a treatment planner, of becoming a digital dentist that can treatment plan cases. Okay, so from there, again, one of the important uses of smile design is team communication, where you can communicate with your patient. Your patient can start playing on the app and adjusting the smile as they want, and they love playing on the app. It's like a game uh, on the iPad to them. And when you start to show them everything in 3D, they start, sometimes even I have engineers, engineers are mostly who love this because they really understand 3D softwares. They sometimes they give us ideas about biomechanics that you could, wouldn't have thought of. Yes, you have a point, we could do that. And this is the point where you communicate with the rest of your team for the full treatment plan. And this is another problem that we have. When you have an interdisciplinary team that are working a periodontist and implantologist, a prosthodontist, all those uh, uh, specialities working on the same case, what happens in the middle? Someone loses track and you don't know where you want to go. But when you're all controlled by a digital design, by digital software, by guides for every single thing, then everyone knows where he needs to go. And you have a back door to go back to or something, a baseline to go back to, the smile design you did it from the beginning to see and make sure that after the orthodontist finished, he has done the work that you need. After the prosthodontist finished, we have done the work we need. And then to give the patient what she, he or she deserves at the end, right? So that is the whole point of team communication. And then last but not least is the digital workflow. And this is where it comes becomes really interesting and we can discuss cases. Ahmed, are you still there? I've been talking for a very long yes, time, I know. Um, don't okay. Sure, yes. Okay, so any questions or should I go on with the cases? I would prefer to go on the, on the cases directly. Okay, are we taking too long, yeah? Not, not too long. All, all of the questions are related. I mean, sometimes someone is asking a question and you just answer it after two or three slides. Perfect. Okay, so uh, no one is bored yet, yes? We're we are all here good for with time. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. So if you want to go through the full workflow, right? What we start, all that's in white is 80% of what we do. Okay, and what's in gray is 20% of our time. So what's in white is 80% of our time. What's in gray is 20%. White is, is our treatment plan and our planning on our softwares and with our patients, okay? And what's in gray is the implementation. So what will make you a better dentist is better visualization, spend more treat time treatment planning. Why? And spend less time implementing this clinically because you have guides now from that treatment plan to implement this very simply with any surgery you can imagine, okay? So you don't need to think of the treatment plan when you're implementing this in the patient's mouth. Why? You already thought of it. You've already implemented it in the guide. You just put the guide in the patient's mouth and do the work. That's it, right? So what makes you a better dentist is when you are a better treatment planner, not a better executor, okay? So what all that's in white is 80% of the time, which you spend treatment planning with your patients, and the what's in gray is in 20% of your time. So again, to go through the workflow so that everyone can top up this, what I've been talking about, and we'll show cases to understand more. When you start with the case, you start with photo video documentation. You take a video and a photo, please recommend a DSLR camera, okay? That's the first point. Then take an impression. If you're going to take an impression, additional silicone, please. Full extension. Okay, because we, we need to see the gingiva if the patient has a gummy smile. And we need accurate impressions, please, so that when they are scanned, we can align them to the photos. And accurate photos with the macro lens and flashes, okay, so that you can have good quality photos. This is very important. The importance of the first of the photo is tremendous because everything is dependent on the 2D photo that you have taken. So you have to be able to master this well. Patient has to be full smile, looking straight ahead, both ears equal, don't not, uh, head cannot be looking down or upwards and both ears are equal on both sides. If she's veiled, please let her really tight, very tight, okay? And make sure that both heads on both sides are equal, okay? So work with what you have. Then send this to your lab technician. They will start doing a facially guided digital wax up or before that, I'm sorry. First thing is you are the smile designer. You have to do the smile design for the patient, not your lab technician. You are the dentist. You are the treatment planner. You are the smile designer. You understand aesthetics more than anyone. You understand it more than your lab technician. I'm sorry. You know your patient. You know what the patient wants. You know the patient's needs, okay? So you have to do the smile design. You have to learn how to do this, right? Otherwise, when the lab technician does the smile design, it's not for that patient, 
right? Yeah, it's better, but then not doing it. But it's best if you do it for your patient. So you do the smile design first. You send a snapshot uh, uh, with uh, 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 of the patient's photo with the lines on it, with the impressions you have taken or the intraoral scan in STL format, and you send this to your lab technician. The next visit, the lab technician does the wax up according to the lines that you have drawn. So there's no place for mistake here. There's no need to send impressions going back and forth and back and forth. Okay, it's just one shot because he's he's controlled by your smile design. Then they send you a printed model. On this printed model, fabricate your silicon index. Take time with this because silicon index is very important to keep the patient on the right side of the brain. Second appointment, patient comes in, put this in the patient's mouth. Do the emotional communication first. Do the motivation first. Very important. Have them to start to go from like to trust. Then give the treatment plan presentation. Give it in a digital format. Show them images of what they need to do. Make them understand very well. They have to understand every single point. The more they understand, the more they are willing to go for their service and the more they trust you because they know that the information that you are giving them is valuable. The best way to get to your patient is to educate them, okay? Even if they're not going to go for the treatment at the end. Believe me, patients that I could never imagine would pay for full arch cases have with just that way, okay? So now is the time for the treatment plan presentation and give them the prices with total confidence because you have seen the motivation or the feelings that they had in their eyes. Give it with total confidence, right? Then. At the end, start to communicate after you get patient approval, start to communicate, do the team communication with your team, and then start fabricating the guides with your lab. And then you go to the execution or the gray part where you go to the 3D softwares and you start implementing. So everything is done beforehand so that you play, you spend less time with your patients. So case, a case classification that you can use or shows the type, all the types of cases that you can use with uh, or you can uh, uh, benefit from uh, doing a smile design and using digital technology and digital softwares because, as we said, VSD is part of a bigger digital uh, dentistry format, right? So you can do additional restorative cases, subtractive restorative cases, ortho cases, crown lengthening cases, single implant cases, fully edentulous implant cases. You can use this for occlusion cases. You can use it for orthognathic uh, concept that I have implemented, I call digital direct composites, where I use the smile design for direct composites in the patient's mouth. And I'll show you really quickly how we do that. And a concept that we have worked on, me and uh, Dr. Islam Esam and Amr Tuhami, originally uh, Dr. Amr Tuhami's idea using uh, smile design or digital density for guides of Botox, uh, for guides for Botox and fillers. Okay, so let's go to the cases real quick. Digital ceramics, the thing that all of us love and all of our patients are asking for now, giving our patients the beautiful smiles that they are looking for and the beautiful smiles that we would wish that we can get or give our patients as everyone else that we see on social media because we're all exposed now on social media and we all can see each other's cases and evaluate. So our main problem, and this was what got me into the smile design, as I said to you, Ahmed, from the beginning, that I would see the case. I don't know what was wrong. Even if the patient was happy about it, I wasn't. And uh, why? Because we are dest a dentists actually are perfectionists. We want everything to be perfect. Even our patients like the result because they don't understand better. We don't. Okay. We want our cases to be to turn flawless because we are perfectionists. And the only way you can do that is when you have the face in relation and use a lot of other things. Using natural tooth shapes, using 3D staining and glazing that we use on milk ceramics and something we call copy paste that. So let's see how this is done. So this is where the concept of the smile design went into the 3D stage, right? So we stopped at the moment or a long time back at just the motivational mock-up and we were not able to deliver final restorations that look exactly as the mock-up. But now we can because we have this and we've started this a long time ago, seven to eight years ago, that we can do this because we are doing it in digital format. So as we said, the uh, importance of natural tooth shapes because we have natural texture there. We do not think of embrasures, uh, uh, gingival or incisal embrasures anymore because we have this with, nat with the natural teeth shapes that we have. We do not think of uh, gingival dentists anymore because we also have this in the natural shapes. We do not think about texture and our lab technicians in, in our lab are 
are are uh, are not allowed to touch the ceramics after they come out of the milling machine. Why? Because we already have that natural tooth structure or natural texture that God has created on those natural shapes that come out of the milling machine. Okay. So the whole point is to give patients natural looking restorations. And the only way you can do that is either your lab technician keeps doing the texture with his hand, which will never be, or we will never understand the algorithms of the texture and shapes that we have that God has created. Why this land angle is with this type of texture or with this type of primary or secondary texture there, right? So the easiest way is to copy natural teeth. And what we're able to do now, every patient that comes in, we scan and we can use their teeth for someone else. Think of it, a mother that has lost her teeth and looks exactly like her daughter. Her daughter can donate her teeth to her once more. So imagine what you can do. This is the natural texture that we were talking about, uh, the, uh, straight out of the milling machine without being touched with our lab technicians. This is the restorations fresh from the milling machine. You can see the all, how thin they are. And of course, being thin in the middle is uh, 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 can go up to a milling machine can mill your ceramics uh, up to uh, 0.2 or uh, 0.2 millimeters in the middle. Yes, but in the margins, if it's less than 0.3, they will break and crack. So be very careful with that. This is something very important when you are uh, implementing your finish line or prepping your teeth. And this is after the 3D staining and glazing te uh, technique where we, this is a, a technique fabricated uh, from uh, Master Paolo Cano, which is uh, one of the top dental technicians worldwide and from Brazil, uh, where when the, to be able to actually copy uh, what we have in the mock-up exactly to the final restorations that we give the patient, we have to have this milk. They cannot be touched with your hand because once they're touched with your hand, they change. They're different, okay? So, but the problem with uh, 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 milled ceramics is they are one block. They do not have life in them. They are not built up, yes, in several layers. So Paolo Cano has, teached, has, has taught us a way of staining the, the ceramic on the, uh, on the surface so that you give that 3D effect to restorations and you'll be able to see that in the coming cases. So what's very important, and this is actually something that, that's detrimental in our concept. And when you, please, when you are evaluating uh, uh, your lab work uh, or the work that your lab has delivered for you, okay? And this is the whole point of the concept, right? That you have predictable results, meaning that when you show your patient a mock-up, the final restorations have to look exactly as that mock-up, given that you have used all the guides to guide you clinically, and your lab technician actually knows how to copy this exactly. And this is why we fabricated our uh, certified lab here in Egypt, because they were trained how to do this step by step. And this is where uh, you can make the difference between a lab that understands and doesn't. So please compare between the mock-up, this photo of the mock-up. This is the design, actually. And this is the CAD design on ExoCAD, okay? And these are the finals in the patient's mouth. Now look at the frontal photo here, here, here. They're the same in all three steps. Look at also the side photo and the texture you have on the mock-up and copied on the CAD design and again copied on the final restorations. And you can see the 3D staining and glazing where you give the translucency and we give the live effect of the natural restorations. Of course, this photo was taken the day two days after uh, cementation when we retract. This was a, during course in Germany and we, we, we retracted uh, with a rubber dam. So of course the papillas retracted in these areas, but you can see that they are all the same in all three photos. And this is the copy paste dentistry concept given that you as a clinician have used all the guides that your lab has given you so that you can execute correctly. Because once you have not prepped 0.2 millimeters of that tooth structure, we will not be able to give you the exact copy. Why? Because the lab already has the fine grain before you have started prepping or before you have started moving the teeth orthodontically or before you have placed the implant. They have the, 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 the result there. And this is the result that we showed the patient during the mock-up phase. So if you haven't prepped up, up to 0.2 millimeters, okay, then the restoration is going to be a little longer. That's It's that simple. So you need a preparation guide to be able to do this. You need a gingivectomy guide to be able to do this. You need a crown lengthening guide to be able to implement uh, your crown lengthening. You need a guide for Botox and fillers if you want. You need an 
implant guide to place the implant in the correct facially guided prosthetic position. You need ortho aligners so that you can get that exact position that we that you showed the patient from the beginning. So you need to be guided in every single step. Okay. This is the patient's before and after. As you can see, it's not about shade. The patient asked for a bleach shade, but we were able to give her natural looking restorations because of the texture and the 3D staining and glazing uh, that we that our lab implemented on the ceramics. And again, a before and after on the other side. I love these shapes. These are shapes that are called F1. They're very, very natural. They're very strong in texture, okay? And this is the patient before and after. Now, this is a lovely photo because when I took this second photo, this was this patient that actually we did in a course here in Egypt. And I asked the patients, or usually all the patients to come after two weeks to the clinic, pass by me so that I can take professional photos of them after because I see them before the course. And I did not ask her to put any makeup. I did not ask her to change her hair color. This is what actually happened to the patient. She actually transferred from this to this, so simply. Just excuse me for a second, because I think my uh, my earphones are running out of uh, of charge. So I'm just going to bring uh, my wired phones and come back in a second. Ahmed, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Ahmed? Yes, yes just clearly. give me a second, okay? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, so I'm sorry about that. Well, I have my calls. We are with you. Okay, so can you hear me? Yeah, clear. Okay, right. So, as you can see, we actually, this is something very valuable that we had to put in mind. Us as dentists, we are actually able to transform our patients' lives. We're able to make them more confident about themselves, change their view of themselves and the perspectives of themselves to a very large extent. You can see that we have changed this, changed her from a, an innocent young girl to a, a really wild, let's say, uh, uh, a personality that she uh, couldn't find in herself un, until she, she changed the shapes of her teeth. And this is what actually, this, these were her own words, what she said, right? So a quick video. I don't think Ahmed, can you hear sound when the videos play? Can you hear the the sound? Uh, would you please play the video? Okay, no, I, be, the videos before. Could you hear sound from them? No. Oh, okay. So there were there was tons of music. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to play this and tell me if you can hear or not. Can you? Yes, I can hear. Yes. Yeah? Okay. Perfect. So I'm just going to stop this for a second to tell you what this video is about. This is. Uh, a video that's going to show you the full workflow from the beginning to the end, the digital workflow from the beginning to the end. It's a case that we did so that you can all understand the steps and the workflow that you need to go through. I go through the workflow several times because this is actually where your com questions come in. What do I do next? What's before what? And uh, so forth. Okay, so please have a look at the video. I hope you enjoy.
Right, just to, to take you all through the workflow very quick, because this is very important, and this is usually where all your questions are, okay? The first appointment, when the patient comes in, the first thing we do is we take a photo of the patient, front and smile, and uh, the other photos if you want, and we take a video, a casual video of the patient, meaning during this video, please do not ask your patient to smile, okay? Just take a video, record, start recording when your camera's on the tripod. You don't have to tell the patient that you're recording now, right? And then just tell your, just start speaking with the patient, say something funny, okay? And your patient will laugh spontaneously. This is the shot you want, right? And then stop recording and then tell your patient that you were recording a video so that uh, 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 you needed the natural smile from the patient. But if you ask the patient during the video, please smile, then there's no point of that, okay? You want the natural smile. So this is the first visit, photo, video, documentation. Then the next step is, Doing your intraoral scan. If you have an intraoral scanner, that's great. If you do not take an impression, please additional silicone, full extension uh, uh, for your patient. Send this to your lab. Ask them to 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 pour it and to scan the models for you and give it to you or send it to you in STL format. Then you take the photo, right, and you start smile designing. Now this is the DSD app. This was this video was done to show you all the different softwares that you can use or implement to do a 2D and a 3D smile design. This is the DDSD app on the iPad, okay? And this is also the 2D smile design that is on 3Shape, that's on Dental System, okay? Whoever knows the 3Shape software. There are tons of softwares out there, okay? You can use whatever you want. Then the next step is doing the digital wax up. We send this photo of the patient's face with the lines around it, okay? We send it to the lab with the STLs. The lab then brings in the STL of the model with the photo, they register them to each other on softwares. And this is where the lab softwares come in. Please, very important uh, to, uh, points. I, I have no benefits from selling softwares for anyone, okay? But it's uh, uh, I have to tell you which softwares you can do this accurately and which not. Uh, the first software that we ever started with, and they started with Christian Coachman implementing the idea of the 3D smile design, is uh, 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 Nemo, okay, uh, or Nemocast from uh, a French company called Nemotech, and this is uh, the align. Uh, this is a, a digital wax up software where you can align the photo to the video uh, to sorry the photo to the model very accurately. Another software is Three Shape on Dental System. Also, you can align the photo or register the photo to the model very accurately. Something, a third thing, a new option on the DSD app now is that you can do your digital wax up on it, okay? And it's much easier for dentists also to implement. Only those three are very accurate. There are other softwares that say that you can register. A lot of people that that, that do their work on that, but I'm sorry, we, we test everything out there uh, uh, and we, we only say what, what, what really can work. Meaning, from uh, by other words, as Exocad is not accurate because it's a only a two-point alignment. It depends on two points between the photo and the model. Okay, I have nothing against Exocad at all. The Exocad is mostly the software that we use for uh, our CAD designs, and you will see this uh, in the upcoming step. But it's not for the digital wax up because it only depends on two points, and then you have to uh, get an average of an alignment between the 2D photo and. Uh, the model. I know I have to say this because we have a lot of text inches with us that always ask this question, which is the best software. You can see here the registration on 3Shape and the registration on Nemo between both and the lines are on the model. And from there, we start doing our digital wax up according to the lines that you have drawn, your 2D lines. So this is 2D to 3D. Then this model is sent or this design is sent to uh, a <clears throat> 3D printer. The 3D printer prints out the model, okay, as the wax up. Then you start uh, fabricating your silicon index, injecting uh, uh, light body first because we want to take the texture and the accuracy that's on the model. We want that beautiful texture to be in the patient's mouth. Then putting on it additional uh, silicon putty and then cutting it as if you're doing a gingivectomy so that you do not have any excess material when you put this in the patient's mouth. You inject then the acrylic. Of course, there are tips and tricks of how to do this so that you don't get air bubbles in your uh, mock-up. And then you put this in the patient's mouth and you remove the excess very quickly without using a handpiece. You can see here a simple trick that we do is we take off if the patient is usually anxious when you are taking the second video because you don't like the taste of the acrylic and whatever else. So take a quick photo with your phone. Show that to your patient real quick. 
and you will see the difference in emotion that the patient is going to give us. See, she's not so happy here. The mock-up is a little bulky, but after she sees the photo, look at her. She gives you a very nice smile. And then you show her on the screen, as I showed you, a before and after, a video playing before and after and replaying once more, okay, with some music. And then you have motivated the patient. Then you do all the guided parts. This is using the Gallic Burel technique of using the prep guide, which is different than the mock-up, please. Uh, a lot of people are using the printed model of the mock-up so that they can use it for a guided prep. That's not the way it works. Why? Because the mock-up is additional and it comes to the outside. But what we use to prep as a guide is the ideal design, meaning the future position of the veneers, which is to the inside more. Okay, so this might need a little more explaining for you to understand, but you cannot use the mock-up as a guide for preps. And then the normal protocol that we all do, we scan again the patient or you take the impression, you send it to your lab technician once more. What the lab technician does then is they put it onto the software and then they go back to the old wax up that they did and they copy that wax up exactly to the final design. You can see here what's in gray is uh, the final design. What's in blue is the wax up. You can see that on the software here on 3Shape and here on ExoCAD, uh, the lab, our lab technician, Dr. Iman Musad, was uh, uh, copying uh, the mock-up exactly so that we can give the exact shapes and the exact result to the patient at, uh, as, she, uh, as uh, she saw from the beginning. An important step, something called the double scan technique to all the people that have bought intraoral scanners and are still thinking of purchasing. This is the best step that you can do actually. Uh, to me, it was one of the best steps that I did in digital dentistry and, and in, in, in my dental career. Uh, you learn a lot from your mistakes. Their intraoral scanners are very valuable. I'm not selling for a certain company, but there is something called the double scan technique. Please put that in mind. When you're using your intraoral scanner and you have a case that you have started, you have scanned in the beginning, and then you have prepped. There is a way that you can scan the second scan or the master cast of your patient after you have prepped. You can scan it on top of your original scan so that it's in the same position every time. Okay. So whoever has bought an intraoral scanner, please ask about that option. Most intraoral scanners have that options, that option now. Interoral scanners, just by the way, are not about accuracy anymore. They are all accurate. The, 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 the technology is there now worldwide with all scanners. It's when you're choosing an interoral scanner, of course, there's difference in accuracies between uh, scanners and others, especially when it comes to full arch cases, right? But when it comes to choosing an interoral scanner, it's mostly now about options that you have with the interoral scan. Okay. Right. Then after the design is done, this design, CAD design, is sent to the milling machine, and it is milled. We did this uh, uh, this case in uh, Vita Enamic HT. Uh, Vita had asked us to test this on a case, so we tested it on the case that we had then. Then these milled blocks come out of the milling machine. They are only polished, right, because Vita Enamic is polished with these uh, rubber cups. They are untouched, meaning the texture stays the way it is. And then they are 3D stained and glazed. Okay, and then put in our patient's mouth, try in, and then cement it for the patient, and we give the patient the final result. Okay, so this is mostly uh, the part that I was uh, planning on giving you all uh, tonight, and I know that we have taken much longer time than we have expected, and Ahmed is probably uh, going crazy right now about the time that we have taken. Uh, As I'm enjoying, I don't care. Uh, we, we are enjoying. Great. No, no worries. So, so just a quick overview of what of the, the remaining three series that I'm going to give in the coming three days. Uh, if you would allow me, Ahmed, uh, I would like yes, to... Yes, yes, sure, on. sure, yes. yes yeah, please, please okay. go. Yes, thank you. So we're going to talk about digital and periodontics, and we're going to show you how we can treatment plan a gummy smile case very quickly and efficiently with five very simple steps so that you can diagnose the case. As we said, treatment plan comes after diagnosis. So, and we're going to show tons of cases. This is the gummy smile case that we had. We do the smile design, a 2D smile design, and then the digital wax up once more. And this is a case that I did with my dear friend, Amr Ikram. We did uh, 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 a guide for the gingivectomy, for the soft tissue removal, and a guide also for the bone removal, which was adapted to the soft tissue and bone. And we're going to talk about CBCTs and how important they are that we can reach a definitive diagnosis for our case and give us all the information where the CAJ is, where the gingival level is, what the crown height is, 
what the root length is, where the bone level is, and everything you need to do, you can understand before you do the case. And then the bone reduction guide, and we're going to show you amazing results that we give our patients and how patients can uh, benefit from what we give them. So I don't want to just burn out all the videos, but uh, just to give you an idea. And then uh, we're also going to have a day of digital and implants. And we're going to talk about a uh, single custom uh, prefabricated custom abutments and crowns on single teeth uh, with uh, uh, socket shield or partial extraction therapy and how we can do this digitally guided. And we ha can have even the abutment and the crown pre-milled before we even place the implant and how we can do this with guides. And how we started to implement this concept about three years ago with certain softwares that were ready at that time. We're also going to show full arch cases and uh, I work with a lot of people and a lot of people uh, uh, that I give, I love to give credit for the work that I've done. This is a surgical guide that was done with Dr. Amr Tuhemi for a full arch case for a clinical course that we we're giving in Berlin, Germany. And then we're going to talk about guides that we use different types of guides. And we're going to show you tons of videos also. I just don't want to burn them out. We're also going to talk about digital occlusion. And our uh, biggest enemy in dentistry to me, I think, is occlusion. And we start to understand that after some time, after we start to master aesthetic cases and we start to give beautiful ceramics for our patients, we then start to see the problems that our patients come back with after three to four years of breaking a veneer or having TMJ problems. Or we start to see other cases, it doesn't have to be our cases, where uh, we have problems or TMD problems there and how to solve them. We're not going to talk about TMDs, but we are also going to talk about something that we are all afraid of doing, raising vertical dimension. How, when uh, is this going to uh, create a temporomandibular disorder for our patient, a case like this where we do not have any occlusive space at all. And we have to increase the vertical dimension to be able to restore uh, the patient's lost two structures. So it's logic only to increase the vertical dimension. So we're going to talk about that, how to do that digitally. And a very simplified process. I know this is going to uh, get you out of your comfort zone. I'm going to show you a way uh, of how to not need to take any Facebook records or mount on analog articulators. I am a very big fan, actually, of Facebooks and articulators. I spent five years of my life teaching only uh, 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 or mostly occlusion and showing uh, my postgraduate students uh, how to mount, how to take Facebook records and how to mount on articulators. But we always had one very big problem. We would go through all that hectic process and then there would come a point where we throw it away because we would still need to do adjustments in the patient's mouth. So again, how, we, how you can use the smile design uh, to, uh, for that to replace certain things, how you can fabricate uh, digital COIS programmers to attain center correlation for your patient, how to also record the vertical dimension and advantages of having intraoral scanners in these types of cases, which is to me one of the most advantages of having an intraoral scanner with occlusion cases, actually, how you can temporize your patients uh, uh, during the, the temporization stage when you have increased the vertical dimension and attained centric relation, how you can make sure that the occlusion is correct. And one of our main problems is actually occlusal adjustments is our main problem because when you have one single crown, you could adjust it for about half an hour to adjust the occlusion, and that by the time you have removed half of that crown height, the, the crown is out of occlusion. So our main problem is we are not able to actually to detect where the interferences and the premature contacts are, and we're not able to detect force by time. So this is a technology that we're going to talk about, which is T-scan. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of it and how valuable this is uh, for uh, full mouth rehab cases and cases where you have increased vertical dimension and attained centric relation. The rescan and overlap technique or the copy paste technique to be used uh, uh, for our final restorations and how we are able to give our patients beautiful and functional restorations at the end with very simple concepts and give them the results they have been waiting for. Um, the digital composite technique, very quickly, I'm not going to talk about this in my series, but uh, a lot of people have been asking about this. I thought of this uh, of a way to actually copy. Uh, uh, the mock-up that was done digitally to the patient's mouth with packable composites, not flowable, because we know that flowable composites cannot be used as a permanent restorations. So I started to think out of the box because a lot of people started asking me for that, how to copy the uh, wax-up or the mock-up on the printed model to the patient's mouth 
And this is the case that we did. And if you see these two photos, see the texture that we have. Actually, this is a fingerprint. This is a defect in the printed model that I didn't see at the time when I was doing the case. But I was happy that it was there because I was able to copy this exactly to the patient's mouth. This is the printed model. This is the patient's mouth. We got the same fingerprint exactly. So this is another technique that I've been working for for some time that is uh, of my innovation that I call digital direct composites. And you can see the frontal view. This is the printed model again. And this is the frontal of the patient. And uh, again, also how you can use smile design. This is not going to be part of our series, uh, unfortunately, but a big part of the gummy smile cases are. This is a concept that uh, was innovated by Dr. Amr Tuhemi and me and Dr. Islam Asim worked on with him how to fabricate facial guides for Botox and fillers and how to give your patient the results that they have been waiting for or been expecting. The take home message, which is very important, is we are trying to be or trying to implement as much as possible our cases 100% digital. Uh, not because we love digital, it's because just because for a very simple and very important reason that it's even it's more predictable, it's faster, but what's more important, it's predictable, it's more accurate, and you're, be, you're able to give the patients the results that you have shown them from the beginning and give, deliver that to the end. And I think that is so important for us to show the patient something and uh, 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 tell them that this is what they're going to get at the end and actually be truthful about it, given that we have used the digital workflow to bring in. And this is super easy now. You just need to follow the steps that we've been talking about. And uh, another message that I like to give when we, uh, the like the same example that I gave about the architect and the engineer and the builder, when, uh, you, when you're when you building, let's say you are building the house of your dreams, right? Uh, and you have this uh, this piece of land that you want to build it on. And this is not something that you can do every day. Yes, if you do it once in your lifetime, this is good. What do you do? You bring in an architect first. You want to do it right. So you bring in an architect first. And the architect takes photos of the, of the landscape. And he uh, can take also 3D images on the landscape. And what does he do next? He, come, he brings you in and he, tells, and he gives you a maniquette of how this house is going to look from the outside according to the surroundings. And he shows you a maniquette of this. He shows you photos of this. He shows you this in 3D software also. He shows you this in 2D and 3D, how this house is going to look at the end, right? And then the next step is he brings in an engineer that starts to plan how the house is going to be divided in uh, 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 from the inside, where the bathrooms are, the size of the bathroom, the, be the bedrooms, and all the division of uh, uh, the rooms from the inside, right? And then they bring this engineer brings in the builder or the builders that, bring, that build uh, stone by stone or brick by brick till you get the house that you have been waiting for. And this process usually takes about, let's say, an year and a half or two years. During these two years, all you've been doing is paying installments for your architect, your engineer and your builders so that you can get the results you have been waiting for. What are the results you've been waiting for? That first maniquette that your architect showed you, right? So what if at the end, after all that time and after all that money spent, you go finally to see the house that you've been waiting for, you only have one thing in your mind, the maniquette you saw from the beginning. What if it looks totally different or a little even different than what you saw in the beginning? Would you pay that last installment? Would you leave that engineer uh, with what he has done? Or would you sue him for not giving you what you saw in the beginning? They do this with engineers, architects, and builders, right? And we cannot do this with a simple set of teeth. We can, but we just need to come out of our comfort zone and accept the capabilities that we can get out of digital technology. So when you are an architect, you are the smile designer. And this is when you smile design for your patient, you show them the manicat with the mock-up. And when you are the engineer, you are the treatment planner because you are planning everything from the inside, biologically, functionally, and aesthetically. And when you are the builder, you are the performer, right? So please spend more time treatment planning and smile designing than performing. Because when you have guides, you do not need to think out the process during the execution phase. So if you can take a snapshot of this slide, if anyone would like to contact me at any time and give me or ask me any questions after the session, I would be more, more than glad uh, to answer. And uh, one last slide 
is uh, you can take a snapshot of this barcode uh, because there's a lot of education coming your way uh, through uh, an entity I'm proud of being part of and a board member of, uh, which is Digital Dentistry Society. And uh, you can all scan this barcode. You, you Through the barcode, you, you can become free members for Digital Dentistry Society. We have a lot of free online lectures on the website. And you can also be active members and get a lot of opportunities. All the benefits are on the website. And you can see uh, a lot of educational videos from there. I'd like to thank you all very much for your time. I know that we took a lot more time than usual. And I'd like to thank Ahmed and, uh, for hosting this uh, my pleasure. Fabulous, Anytime. Uh, occasion, and I would be glad if we have time and we still have questions. I would be glad to answer them if you if if you would like that. Okay, uh, Doctor uh, Mohammed Arif is asking, Doctor, can you explain more about the guided preparation without using a mockup? We will use uh, the impression index only, and why not no. use? Okay, so Mohammed, this is going to be quite difficult for you to imagine. Okay. Uh, let me try to uh, see if I can bring in some slides that you can understand this more. Let me just remember, try to remember where this presentation is. I'm not going to take too much of your time. Uh, and I'll try to explain why I'm, I'm opening the presentation, right? Okay, so, Mohammed, you have to understand that there's, diff there's a difference between the mock-up and the ideal design, meaning. Right there, excellent. So if you look at this slide, yeah, this is the mock-up. What do we do with the mock-up? We, everything is, is to the outside with the mock-up, mean, meaning everything is additive. That means even if the patient's teeth are flared to the outside, the mock-up is over it, okay? So the mock-up is using the same shapes, the same the smile design, the same everything, the same parameters, the same everything, but it's not going to be the final position of let's say if we're going for a veneer case, it's not going to be the final position for the patient. The mock-up is always additive, why? Because you are showing this to the patient. To be able to motivate the patient, there has to be bisacrylic or tempicram material covering all the teeth so that you can give the emotional effect to the patient. The only thing you tell your patient then is this is to the outside. In the finals, they will come to the inside. So the only difference between the mock-up and your final design is that the mock-up is in front, the final design is to the back, okay? So when I bring the mock-up to the outside, this has nothing to do with my final. So I cannot use this as a guide to prepare, okay? Because I've taken it outside haphazardly. But when you imagine my final design, when I bring the teeth to the inside to the final position, okay? And I, when I bring them to the final position, there are parts of the teeth, as you can see here, that are going to see through the design. This is the, what we call the ideal design. When this part is bulging out, this is what I use as a preparation guide. The parts that are excess, I remove first, and then I can use this as a guide for preparation. I know that this is the most difficult part to visualize, and I've uh, been for some time uh, thinking of actually making like an animation for this part because it's the, the most question that I'm always asked in, in, any, uh, in any lecture. It takes some time just to digest, but uh, just for you to understand, we, we use the preparation guide with the ideal design, not the mock-up, okay? So you cannot use the mock-up as a preparation guide. Another question, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, what is the difference between the motivational mock-up and the guided mock-up? Uh, that's, that's the same question exactly. So uh, the, the, the motivational mock-up is to motivate, okay? okay? The ideal design or the prep guide, it has a lot of names is the, the guide that we use for preparation. This is the position of the teeth or the, or the wax up in the final position, okay? okay. It's the same question exactly. Uh, someone, uh, Dr. Hussein is asking, uh, uh, from where did you learn all of this? <laughs> 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 you should attend that. <laughs> if it's from I, dental I, course I, or a specific university, it's a big, it's a, it's a long journey. <laughs> okay, let me tell you. Yes, it's a long journey, but I'll keep it short because this is an important question that everyone uh, likes to know. I learned by time, uh, and what, what will make you learn even more and be better and better is that you evaluate yourself always. So I'm still learning till now. Every second I learn. Why? Because I always evaluate myself. And when I evaluate myself, I find that I still have defects in a certain area and I need to grow in that area. So I take another course or I learn uh, 
I believe in self-learning. And please, all of you try doing this. You can teach yourself. Yeah, uh, you can teach yourself online. Please read, read a lot of articles, read a lot of textbooks. You try to teach yourself. Right? And what you don't understand, then go attend the course that you really didn't understand. And that's that's how I do. Okay. Uh, what yeah. is the material we will use for ideal design? Like. Uh, it seems من الواضح يا محمود ان الثلاث ساعات يعني okay so the design is is the same design as the mock up but the mock up is additive as you can see here a little better the ideal design is see this is the mock up all additive right and then we bought the teeth to the inside so the parts of the teeth that need to be prepped have started to see through the wax up right this is again a 3D printed model that we send you and then you do a silicon index on that and you put bisacrylic in it and you put this in the patient's mouth. And this is exactly what you will see in the patient's mouth. A part of the tooth that you can see and a part of the uh, bisacrylic, yeah? And then we start to do the preparation guide steps, okay? Using depth cutters. Mahmoud uh, for patient... Uh... Digitalization, do I always need Combeam CT? No, you do not always need a CVCT, only certain cases. Uh, let's say, of course, for implant cases, you have to do a CVCT for a crown lengthening or a gummy smile case. I do CVCTs, but with retractors or with cotton rolls, because I see that they're very, very valuable. They give me a lot of information that I, that I cannot get clinically or very difficult to get clinically. Um, only when indicated, you do a CBCT. Just, just when when you need really need it, do a CBCT. When you don't, don't. Ahmed. Yes. Hello. Yeah. You want to talk about Okay. So uh, where 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 did we reach? So only okay. do a CBCT when you really need it. Uh, when you need to evaluate the patient's bone. Uh, gummy smile case, you need to evaluate patient's bone in 3D. This is very important. Um, if some people see that it's a must, but there's a lot of valuable information that you can get from CBCTs with gummy smile cases. You're going to place an implant, of course. You're going to go do any type of surgery, bone surgery. Yes, you need the CBCT. Only do CBCT when you need it. Okay? Uh, from Dr. Ahmed uh, Hassan, a very important question. In full mouth rehab cases, can you explain how to mount upper and lower jaws digitally without articulator at proper vertical dimension needed? Yes, I know this is a lecture. This is yeah, a lecture. Yeah. <laughs> this is a lecture that, that we're giving on Wednesday. Okay, if you everyone can go to my timeline and on the DSDT members Egypt study group, you will find the, the schedule that I'm giving this week. Uh, I'll be talking about occlusion uh, on one day. I'll be talking about gummy small cases on a separate day, and I'll be talking about implant treatment planning, digital implant treatment planning on a separate day. I just can't remember the dates uh, now. There, I think it's Sunday, Monday, and then Wednesday. Okay? Sunday, Monday, Wednesday. Okay. Uh, at the end, I would appreciate uh, your time, and I, I value your efforts and uh, the, 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 the valuable information we have here, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, thank you for uh, for your contribution. I wish we can extend our lecture for extra two hours. It seems you have a lot of videos, a lot of uh, a lot of content. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, apology for, for questions we didn't answer because there is uh, other question related to the topics, other not related to the topic. So, um, uh, if Dr. Mahmoud, I would ask you just if you can answer uh, the question in the comments because it's not related to the, mainly to the topic. It's uh, like a, a para question, but it's a it's important question too. And I wish you best of the luck in your next lectures. And if anyone would like to follow Dr. Mahmoud, he is doing a great courses. You can follow his timeline. You can find the timetable. You can find all the details. And I wish you a good night for all of us. Thank you, thank Dr. Thank you very Mahmoud. much, Ahmed, and thank, thank you for your audience. Inshallah. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and uh, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Shufak ala khair, inshallah. Thank you. you. Have a good day. Bye. Okay. Goodbye. Bye-bye.